Boom. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? I hope everyone's having a good day. It's that was wild. Um, now, I thought I was going to get an extra day in on this. I thought that I was going to um, I thought I was going to be doing a recap and saying like, all right, here's what we can expect for gonna um, get an extra day in on whoop. this. I thought that I was going to um, I thought I was going to be doing a recap and saying like, I am in echo. All right, there we go. I've killed that. That it's a it's not a day where I don't have some uh, fun sound problems. So <laughs> I thought I would be saying like, here's what we can expect. Here's my predictions for uh, the jury, and then the jury surprised me by coming back really really fast. Um, I was like, oh, right, two and a half hours. Um, so. Um, it wasn't even two and a half hours. It was, you know, it was real fast. It was just like, okay, that that's a quick turnaround. Cool. So um, let's talk about today. Um, because we already know what the verdict is. Wait, I see people saying, wait, you guys haven't heard. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So, uh, for the people who haven't heard, the jury came uh, to it like they were gone for two and a half hours and they came back and they convicted. Um, I they convicted specifically on count one, the negligent uh, homicide aspect. The and I see people who are saying spoiler free, I'm gonna tell you because otherwise you're gonna get it spoiled by the chat, like it's just gonna happen. Um, so uh, they convicted on the, you know, <laughs> on the first count, the uh, the killing count, and they acquitted on count two, the evidence tampering. So today we are going to cover uh, the last witness that was called. We're going to talk about him. We are going to talk a little bit as well about, um, we're going to talk a little bit as well about uh, the the closings. We're going to talk a little bit further about what happens with uh, with Baldwin and Hannah, because Hannah actually has another trial going. So um, we got lots to talk about. But before we do that, I also want to talk a little bit about Rick Hogue. Now, I don't know if you guys know, Rick Hogue is a friend of the channel. He's a friend of mine. Um, he does. Uh, he was the sort of organizer and mastermind behind uh, the Lawyers and Dragons program, if you saw that. Um, and Rick Hogue is a really, um, he's a brilliant guy. He's an absolute awesome guy. And unfortunately, the universe decided that they that it wanted to take down Rick Hogue. And they knew that they couldn't just, you know, do that with anybody. They knew that they had to send the toughest person they could, the only person who'd have a shot at Rick Hogue, and that was Rick Hogue's own brain. So um, they sent um, Rick had a stroke um, and he survived in large part because his wife was there and helped get him to a hospital. But also, you know, he is grateful for all of the support from folks like you. So Rick then proceeded after he had the stroke to have an amazing recovery, a really, um, you know, he's not a hundred percent. He's not, you know, he's not a hundred percent, but he is, he had a really amazing recovery. And uh, because of that, he went on and also not another one. This was the first one, um, not another one, <laughs> but Rick then proceeded to, get out of uh, the hospital and then turned around and put three or thirty thousand dollars on their scoreboard. He raised thirty thousand dollars for the hospital. And because of that, Rick is up for a stroke hero award. And I am dropping the link in the chat. Um, I'm just dropping that here and I'm going to um, I'm going to try to catch that and pin it uh, just so that we can uh, so Guys, if you could go and um, if if you can go and vote for him, that would be much appreciated. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's talk about the uh, the trial today because it was um, 
it was a wild one. It was a bit of a, a you know, this has been a crazy trial. And then, uh, and yes, you can vote every day for the next two weeks. So um, you don't just have to vote today. You can vote all the days. So um, let's talk about their first witness because they call a witness. And I'm going to embiggen on this end. I'm going to demute. And then I am going to pull this up on the screen so that you guys can see it. Uh, do, 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 do. There we go. Um, so now we've got the first witness. And this is PJ Pierce or PJ Pesh. Sorry. Well, this was one of the problems they run into. What was their defense? I couldn't uh, identify one. Um, it was sort of like 40. All right, you may be seated. Good morning, jurors. Thank you so much for your patience. All right, next witness. Jeremy we call PJ Pesh. So this is the defense's last witness that they're calling right now. Um, Do you swear firm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, have a seat talking to the microphone. And this guy didn't bring any guns, so yeah. Good morning, sir. And you please tell the jury your full name. Uh, it's Paul Peter Pesh Jr., but uh, I've always been referred to as PJ Pesh. Mr. Pesh, what do you do for a living? Uh, I direct and write movies and television. How long have you been in the business of directing and writing movies and television? Uh, 35 years. That's impressive. Can you give the jury a background on your uh, movies that you've directed and kind of a biographical sketch? Sure. Uh, I attended Columbia University uh, and studied under Martin Scorsese and did a short film that traveled around the world. I wound up getting a deal at Paramount in 1990. Um, I directed a film for Roger Corman in 1991 that I wrote and directed in 1995. I directed a Western with Sam Elliott that we actually shot at Bonanza Creek Ranch. Um, Sam Elliott, of course, is, lower budgeted is awesome. Schedule. Uh, I've directed six feature films and close to 100 hours of television. Um, I've created television shows, um, written and sold movie scripts. Um, I've worked for Paramount, uh, Warner Brothers, HBO, Universal, Fox. Anything else? I, that, that's um, a really good background. And I, I just want to ask you with regard uh, to the Western on Bonanza Creek. That's also the site of, of where Rust was found. Is that right? That's what I understand. Yeah. Well, Mr. Pesh, um, it sounds like Back you have Mr. Pesh, we don't need to see Hannah. involving firearms. Yes. Um, many of the television shows and I think four or five of the six films two of them were westerns uh one of now i can't figure out i see that his tie is like a black tie on a black suit which is normally funeral wear that's kind of an interesting choice um but he's got something on the tie and i can't tell if it's some weird pattern or logo or something like that or if his tie is um is dirty so i just don't know them was one of the sniper series with tom berenger uh, one of them was uh, Smoke and Aces, which had a considerable amount of gunfire. In your uh, work on the movies involving uh, gunfire, have you had the occasion to work with armors and prop masters? I have. And actually, in all of the movies you've done, I'm sure I'm certain you've worked with prop masters. Yes. Okay, sir. And with regard to those movies that you've directed in television, have you worked with uh, directors, first assistant directors, and understood people's roles on these set? I have. Okay. With regard to armors, have you ever worked on a prior film in which an armor had split duties is an armor and a props. I have not. With so basically what is this guy here for? We're going to go through this guy fairly quickly because we're going to, um, we're going to spend most of our time on the closings. Um, what is this guy here for? He's here to say, basically it was really weird that, um, that she doesn't get the full time that she is bullied that, uh, you know, she is, you know, browbeaten and so forth. Uh, but this guy, one of the things that's weird is I don't see him, like they have him listed 
um, as a movie set safety expert, yeah, but I'm waiting for the tendering the situation where there is a uh, gun heavy set. I will represent to you. Would you think in your experience, what you've seen, it would be advisable to have a part-time armor doing two jobs? I would say that would be highly inadvisable. Whose responsibility is it to properly staff with regard to the movie functions? Uh, the line producer or the, the unit production manager. When you have a set involving upwards of 20 firearms, would it be, in your experience, possible for a part-time armorer to manage that? I wouldn't imagine so. Um, one person can, each one of those weapons needs to be tracked pretty consistently for the set to remain safe. So I don't see how a single person can keep their eye on 20 firearms. So basically, this is his main point. They never actually tender him as an expert, which is weird. The other thing is some people have wondered who that guy is in the background. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Um, this guy here, this guy in the background. It seems that he's probably Hannah's brother or something along those lines. So that seems to be where we're looking at there. Um, no. Okay, thank you. All right, so both sides have rested. It's Oop. now my... Ah, uh, this is not doing the uh, picture in picture, which normally it does. I don't know if there's a way for me to turn that back on. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to f get that to load here. The UPM or the first AD. In your experience, uh, have you worked and seen the interaction between prop masters and armors? I have. And can you tell the jury in your experience generally how they interact, uh, who's in charge of the firearms and who's in charge of the ammunition and what the prop master role is? Well, the prop master, more often than not, hires the armor because that's a subset of that department. But the armor is in charge of all ammunition, all firearms. Sora's got uh, opinions in the background. Uh, keeping them safe and inventorying the ammunition. With those duties and responsibilities, would you believe it to be important in your experience to accord the armor adequate time to do those duties? Yes. And would it be important to accord adequate resources uh, for that armor to do those duties? Yes. If there is a scenario where the um, armor is dealing with uh, a gun heavy set, not having those resources, who would you expect to assist that, that armor in getting those? Props. So now I'm trying to take us to the cross-examination here. The question, do you yes. remember? Yeah. Gutierrez. So, um, okay, so now we're going to look at the cross-examination. Yeah, Zora sees um, something outside. And somebody was asking what I'm drinking. This is a Caesar. Follow-up questions for you. Thank you for your time today. Certainly. Um, so anyone on the crew can stop filming due to safety concerns. Is that right? That's right. And that includes Ms. Gutierrez. That's correct. Um, and... Sir, did you read or watch the statements of Ms. Gutierrez in preparation for your testimony? I did not. That was my understanding. Um, I like that. I did not. That was that was my understanding. Uh, somebody says, what is the Caesar? It is Clamato. Um, it is uh, Clamato Vodka Spices. So are you aware that on October 21st, 2021, um, Ms. Gutierrez... Okay, people are saying they're having trouble hearing the court. Let me fix that. Um, I got it at 300%. Let me, uh, oh, it somehow reverted. I don't know why it reverted. I thought I had it at 300%, but. There is, was not Better? inside the church with the gun, not because she was working on props, but because she was just doing some other armor duties. Objection, Your Honor. So now they're having a big old, uh, Huh, sidebar here. Do I need to restate the question? Do you yes, remember? Yes, okay. Uh, so my question for you is: uh, we we saw some some uh, interviews from Ms. Gutierrez, and and she does uh, explain that she was not in the church because she was um, preparing her fanny pack and her blank ammunition for the next scene. You agree that that's sounds like armor work to to, to you, not props work. Yes. Okay. Um, and are you also aware, sir, that on the morning of the twenty first, when the crew was waiting for replacement camera personnel to arrive, Ms. Gutierrez had approximately three hours uh, to work on her preparation for the scenes that day? I was not aware of that. Okay, thank you. I'll pass the witness. 
I was not aware that she had three hours of prep time. Like, you know, when he was saying, oh, she's rushed, she's whatever. And it's like, did you know she had three hours? No? Okay. Um, now, I missed an ingredient on my uh, Caesar because the Caesar is best with uh, a little bit of hot sauce. And I have my own hot sauce, which I have not yet been able to sell to anybody, but my own hot sauce. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is going to kill me. <laughs> there we go. A little bit of hot sauce in there. <laughs> For the folks who don't know, this hot sauce is lethal. Uh, someone says, what kind of peppers did you use? Uh, this is mostly habanero based. Um, it is quite spicy. So... All right, um, let us roll through. And like that was the cross-examination. You didn't know there was three hours, right? So, yeah. Now, um, guys, given that you already know the verdict, do you want me to cover the, um, do you want me to cover the jury instructions or not? Um, I'll just let you guys give me sort of a, um, a take on that. Do you want me to, uh, to cover the jury instructions? Because, um, we already know how the jury came out. I'm seeing no, I'm seeing yes. All right. I'm seeing a lot of no's. So we're going to skip the jury instructions. We're going to go straight to the closings. Um, and I think that was my inclination anyway. Uh, Where's this jury instructions? Now we're on to state closing. And we're going to embiggen this. So let's talk about what makes a good um, what makes a good close. Typically, what you want in a closing argument is to tell a good story. Uh, you want to be able to leave the jury with an impression of... Um, you want to be able to leave the jury with something to explain to them what happened and to make it make sense and to basically present a, um, present a story that they can understand and that they can grasp and that is going to... Uh, sort of tie it all together. A bad set of clothes, you know, bad closing is really often one that either doesn't make sense where you get contradicted. Uh, we'll talk about the jury question when we get there. Um, and Jackie, um, she wasn't, that's the thing. She just chose not to be there. We're also going to talk about this, why she was remanded. So, um, all right. Somebody said, hey, um, you know, Runkle, take a sip of your hot sauce. I do this fairly often. Cheers. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's watch this. Because we want juries to discuss to decide based on the law. That's why. Uh, live rounds were loaded in the gun in this case. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May it please the court, counsel. Um, I want to begin by thanking you all for your time. I know that this has been a, a long trial, and um, I also understand that as jurors, you find yourselves maybe a little frustrated. There's a lot of sitting around and waiting, um, and uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate the sacrifice that you make when you leave your jobs and your families and your other responsibilities, and you come to court uh, to participate in a very, very important part of our justice system. This is something you almost always do in um, in closings, which is that you um, you tell the jury how much you appreciate them, right? And it's just very common. You're going to see the defense do it too. Uh, everybody does this. It's just that's that's customary, and the jury appreciates it. So, on behalf of the state of New Mexico, uh, we thank you very much for your time. 
And as you can see on your screens, we end exactly where we began, in the pursuit of justice for Helena Hutchins. I want to start by... So they show us a picture there. Um, now, this is something a lot of people had trouble with, is the definition of willful. Omitting to do, failing to do something can be willful, right? Just generally outlining, Hannah Gutierrez failed to maintain firearm safety, making a fatal accident willful and foreseeable. And please keep in mind that omissions can also be willful. So if we fail to do something that we should do, and that failure uh, results in someone's death, then that too uh, can be willful. So I would ask that you keep that in mind as we move through uh, some of the evidence and testimony that you have heard. I know that you have heard a lot, and I do not intend to keep you too long, uh, but I do have to be thorough. I do want to hit uh, some high points. So now, she really needed to do this on her open. She really needed to tell the jury how, like, what the path to conviction is, right? Um, and this is the thing. Was it really willful? She definitely messed up. Uh, willful is, doesn't necessarily mean that it was like that she intended to kill the person and she's going to address that, right? It's not because if she'd intentionally killed somebody, then that would be murder. Not, you know, not any of that. So, um, willful can include like a failure and legal vices. Good to see you. I pepper sprayed myself the other day, accidentally put scorpion Tabasco sauce instead of regular Tabasco on a burger and put it in a sizzling pan, instantly vaporized the sauce and gassed me. Um, there are several times my wife has had to leave the room when I was cooking. So, so I do appreciate your patience. Um, here's what we saw. These videos, if you recall, that were taken by production outfitters, they were taken on October 13th of 2021. What these demonstrate to you is that Ms. Gutierrez was unwilling to maintain proper firearm safety repeatedly. And this is just going to be brutal, the, uh, you know, this part. And it's really important because this is not a case where Hannah Gutierrez made one mistake. And that one mistake was accidentally putting a live round into that gun. That's not what this case is about. This case is about constant. So if you see the guy. Where Hannah Gutierrez made one mistake. And that one mistake. Watch the guy in the red. And just like was accidentally putting a live round into that gun. That's not what this case is about. So he's there picking this his case nose. This is about um, the uh, that guy seems to be like Hannah's brother. The guy who is picking his nose, picking his face, all of those things. That's lots of people have wondered about that. But yeah, constant, never ending safety failures that resulted in the death of a human being and nearly killed another. So let's talk about all of the safety failures that we saw and the reason that these safety failures prior to October 21st are so critically important to the analysis is because they go to foreseeability. And foreseeability is a very important element in this case. So as we can see here, we have our um, stunt man with his double barrel shotgun from watching those videos, what you understood is that Ms. Gutierrez this is did appear to, in fact, be present. Cousin because somebody. At times we saw her, and at times we heard her. So she wasn't off doing prop duties. She was right there, and she never intervened. Gun pointed at a child. Gun pointed at Joel Souza directly at his back. Gun pointed up in the air in the direction of the stunt coordinator. Gun pointed, again, apparently in the direction of Mr. Souza, the person on the far right. Gun pointed directly at Mr. Souza, again, the firearm in the left hand of the stuntman who is facing you. Firearm pointed directly at a minor child. Like, this is to establish that not only is Hannah, like, this isn't just like some casual thing, that Hannah didn't do anything about for safety. She didn't do anything. And this is destructive firearm pointed directly at the camera i actually read that as over the camera but ms gutierrez holding that same firearm with the muzzle pointed at her own face 
<laughs> and her expression here is like, oh, oh. Um, this was unexpected. Ms. Gutierrez stood by and did nothing in between scenes when that stuntman, who had certainly been sent the message that he could do whatever he wanted with those guns, no one was going to intervene. The person tasked with intervening was not going to do it. That was clear. He hands the firearm to the child and allows the child to manipulate the gun before then after a short period of time, perhaps thinking better of it and taking the gun back. This firearm, I actually don't think in this photo that the firearm is pointed at the child. I think the firearm is based on the angle of the camera, probably more pointed at this person right here. Um, but. And you see how she can even be like, I'm just going to be reasonable about this. It's not pointed at the kid. It's pointed at this other dude. She's there. We hear her. We see her. She does nothing. Absolutely nothing. This is some of the first evidence that yeah. we see where if something doesn't stop, if something doesn't change, she is moving in, in the direction of potentially a fatal incident. And she that is was exactly what ridiculously happened. negligent from what we've seen. And I want you to recall Ms. Gutierrez's interview on November 9th when Ms. Gutierrez uh, spoke of the accidental discharge with the other stuntman. It's worth noting here that literally nobody... Like, the defense couldn't get anybody to testify to actually seeing Hannah check the rat. Like, like, there's no, like, nobody seems to have ever seen her actually rattling rounds. Um, having a complete lack of understanding of her role in safety on this movie set. She's talking about Sarah Zachary. And she was like, well, yours just went off in there after you loaded it. And I said, yeah, well, I can't be responsible for every dickhead fucking stunt guy that gets a hold of the gun and doesn't understand the concept that it's hot. And the reason why this is important is that she can, in fact, be responsible for every dickhead fucking stunt guy that gets a hold of the gun. That is her job, is to be responsible for those people, right? That is literally her job. Her entire job is to be responsible for exactly that. And when she took this job, she agreed to that responsibility. There is no exception in the law for your young. The exception in the law does not exist. The law treats everyone the same, and it must. What was the point to the testimony about the lever action rifle? Well, here's the point to the testimony about the lever action rifle. More negligence, more carelessness, more lack of attention to safety. She loaded a lever action rifle with dummy rounds that, by the way, according to the director, was completely unnecessary. Because, yes, while it's true, this gun operates in a way where if a certain type of camera angle is hitting it, dummy rounds would be appropriate if the scene calls for loading or cycling. There wasn't a scene that called for that. So she just loaded a lever action rifle with dummy rounds and surprisingly put the wrong caliber round in the gun. That is absolutely an example of someone who is not paying attention, not taking their job seriously. Now, to be fair, um, I'm going to be fair to Hannah here on this point, which is that um, you you absolutely can make that mistake. And somebody says, can I put the Rick's link in the description? It's actually in the pinned comments, but I will um, also put it in the description here. So, yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the rounds that you've seen because it's critical to tracking the existence of the live rounds on this movie set. And we have spent a lot of time and effort tracking those rounds around that movie set. We're going to show you that evidence right now. So this is where the, the prosecution finally gets to tie things together, where they get to actually, because the problem with the prosecutor is that they, uh, the problem with like a trial is that you actually have to, you got to call your evidence as it is there, but you don't actually get to tell the story a lot of the time with the witnesses here. She's going to be able, like all of this evidence that she got out, she gets to spin it together and tell us how it makes sense. 
And some of this, I was like, okay, now it's really coming together. I was watching this going, I didn't think of that, but those two pieces of evidence go together really nicely. I thought this was good. The important thing to know is that the Seth Kenny dummies, which you are looking at right here, are patinaed. They are distinct. They have an antique coloring. They also have silver primers. These rounds did not come on that movie set until October 12th of 2021 because Mr. Kenny didn't have them. And if you recall his testimony, he was in Texas. So he had to get back, clean them up, and provide them to Sarah Zachary. And that took place on October 12th. This is just simply the primer side of those rounds. You can see that they're dark in color on the primer side, and they do appear to have silver primers. This is a photograph of the 3840 dummies. If you recall Mr. Kenny's testimony, the 3840 dummies came from Billy Ray. And the important thing about this photograph is that none of those dummy rounds had silver primers. And silver primer is a very important piece of this puzzle. This is those same rounds on their side. You can see that they are shiny brass. We also know that they have brass primers. We just saw that. Uh, based on Mr. Kenny's testimony, you know that they were 3840, but there was also some 4440 caliber rounds um, in that box. Does that matter they're not working? Well, let's stop. Okay. I also like this. Is that monitor not working? Okay, we'll take a pause. I want defense to be on the ball on this one. Like, I want them to see this. <laughs> that, that like, I wanted them to see them. This kind of feels like the, and I didn't watch the Game of Thrones. I've only seen, like, clips of it. But, like, the, you know, tell her. I want her to know that it was me. <laughs> That's kind of what that feels like. Um, Are you seeing this, Mr. Bulls? Okay, good. I want you to get this in full view. <laughs> Let's take a moment to talk about all this testimony that you've heard about whether or not the live rounds found at PDQ, which are photographed there on the left, match the live rounds found on the set of Rust. You don't have to be a gun expert to look at those and see they simply do not match. Even though you could look at those rounds and fundamentally understand that they are not the same, the police department, sorry, the sheriff's department sent them to the FBI for testing so that we could actually have some experts confirm what we can see with our very own eyes. And what you have in evidence, if you want to see them in, in real time, you have States Exhibit 79, you have States Exhibit 91. States Exhibit 79 is a disassembled live round from PDQ Props. States Exhibit 79 is a disassembled live round from the set of Rust. You can look at them. You can see the projectiles are different. You can see that uh, it, perhaps the primers are even, are, are even different. If you recall, uh, Ms. Popple indicated there were only 10 silver primered live rounds found at PDQ. The rest of them were brass. The other thing that you can just see with your eyes is the gunpowder in these is substantially different. It has a different chemical composition. So any argument that could ever be made in this case that Seth Kinney was the source of these live rounds is absolutely dishonest. Defense bites this is bait. You know, any argument is dishonest. Defense bites in on this and he does a good job with uh, with responding to it, like coming up with a catchy phrase for it and so forth. But this is bait. This is them trying to get um, this is them trying to get, you know, this to the defense to respond to it and the defense does. So, yeah. Somebody says Hannah's mugshot has been released. No. I am wondering where that is. Take a take a walk in the weeds with me here, okay? This is a photograph of October 10th of 2021. You can see the color of the rounds at the top. Those are brass primered rounds. The rounds in the bottom appear to be lighter. And I would suggest to you, based on the totality of the evidence that we're going to go through, that you are looking at live rounds. And keep in mind, anything that you see on the set of this movie that is a revolver ammunition, that is revolver ammunition prior to October 12th, if it has a silver primer, it's a live round. Because the silver primered dummies didn't come on set for two days after this photograph was taken. Now, I didn't realize that. That was, that was I was like, oh man, 
Uh, somebody says mugshot is on ABC news article that was just released. If somebody could send that to me, like by a Twitter DM or something, that would be, um, that would be appreciated. Cause, um, we could look at that. Here's our comparison photo that Mr. Primo put together for us. And if you need it, when you're reviewing the evidence and doing your deliberations or engaging in your deliberations, I have included it for you. Um, but we're going to do a comparison here in a moment. Now, the importance of this photograph, still October 10th of 2021, there, are, there appears to be revolver ammunition in the background there at the top. Two of those have silver primers. The problem with that is the silver primer dummies weren't there yet. Now, I just want to note, uh, like this argument is really, I think, um, this is really stitching it together. But um, the... The, this thing about like um, um, like revolver ammunition, there isn't really revolver ammunition. There's revolver. There's ammunition in certain categories, but um, there isn't really revolver ammunition. I have a rifle that will take forty-five long colt. So, yeah. But the live rounds were. And there's your close-up. It's absolutely undeniable. Is it blurry? Yes. Can you clearly see the difference? Absolutely. All of these photos that you're looking at were October oh, 10th. And I've got the mugshot. Now, let's move to October 13th of 2021. I invite you to look at that photograph carefully and ask yourselves, which of these is not like the others? It's the third one from the left. Look at the shape of that projectile and look at the color of the brass. So on October 13th, Mr. Kenny's dummies have arrived on set. They are the only dummy rounds with silver primers, but they are patinaed in color. So when you look at this round, it appears to be a spot on match for the live rounds, but unfortunately- He didn't clean them off. He removed some of the patina, but not all of them. They remained patinaed. There was a bunch of patinaed ones that were on, on the set, so. They, they are there. Fortunately, we can't see the primer in this photo, so we can't tell if this is a brass primered dummy. That's the reason that we watched thousands of videos and looked at thousands of pictures, because then we moved to the production outfitter videos from October 13th, the same day, and we're looking at that same gun holster that was provided to Mr. Baldwin. Yes, absolutely. And there you see it. Um, it's really, it was really common. Uh, for instance, I'm trying to get a hold of a lever action rifle for myself in 357 so that I can use 357 uh, in both revolvers and in a lever action gun. The third one down has a silver primer. And now you know it is a live round. You know that because it's not a Seth Kinney dummy. If it were, it wouldn't have that shiny brass color. So. And this is where we're getting to finally see her put all of this together and string this together and show that she's done all of this work to trace these bullets. And this, to me, shows that she's been really careful. She's been really following this along and going through all of the, um, you know, all of these details. So I'm like, this is awesome. We're we're finally getting to see the work that she's done. And yeah. Uh, David, uh, what kind of gun training are you looking for? You've got my email address. I still need to respond to you about some of this stuff. We still got to do a thing together at some point. Um, depending on what kind of gun training you're wanting, uh, let me know and I can I can get you hooked up. So we'll uh we'll figure it out. Oh, there's your live round. We've seen it on October 10th. We've seen it on October 13th. And there's absolutely no way that the lighting is playing tricks on our eyes when we're looking at these enhanced photos because you see it frame after frame. The point she's making is that at this point, the only silver primered ones on the set were the live rounds. And that later, some other silver primered ones show up, but they're the Seth Kenny uh, patina dummies. So that's what she's, that's the point she's making. Um, 
you can own guns in Canada. I own a lot of guns. I have guns um, nearby. Um, I could like, I can't bring them on stream, but if I could, I could pause and then like grab a gun. It wouldn't be that hard. After frame. And now let's move to October 15th. Karen Kuhn arrives on set. I think she was probably there long before the 15th. She is taking photos. She took approximately, as she testified, 9,000 photos. Um, so David, 15th, let me know what your timeline is. I might be able to teach you some things. There it is. There's your silver primer. It's just been moved to a different location in the holster because they're pulling dummy rounds from here, there, and everywhere and putting them in belts and putting them in guns and do, you know doing whatever they want to do. But there it is. It's right there on October 15th. And you see how she's able to tell us this story. This is a story. She's telling us the story of this live cartridge moving through the set, right? And how it's going through, how it's wandering, how it's, you know, all of this, right? And if you think I'm stretching it, let's have a look at what we've got here. This is the gun belt that was assigned to actor Jensen Ackles because his gun belt was not a shoulder holster. We weren't able to find any photos or videos of it in the thousands and thousands and thousands that we reviewed because they're always covered by his coat. There is the evidence photo of the Baldwin holster on October 21st when it is taken into evidence. You have a Seth Kinney dummy at the top. You have what the FBI determined to be a live round in the second spot. And then you've got three brass primered dummies. October 17th, October 21st. So the video that Mamie Mitchell laid the foundation for, she said she said that according to her notes, the filming was done on the 17th. Mr. Primo said that he believed according to the camera, it was the 18th. Take whatever date, whatever date you want. That's a match. Seth Kenny dummy at the top, live round next. You've got three brass primer dummies on the 21st, four brass primer dummies on the 17th or 18th. But it is shockingly the same. And there is no question that this one right here is a live round. It was sent to the FBI and they confirmed it. They sent it to the FBI and confirmed it, right? I really like this close. I really like it. Oh, hey, Nikki Johnson. Saw you on EDB tonight. You got a new sub. Thank you so much. Um, I... I see people in the chat saying that the jury, uh, that we've seen a juror speak. We're going to cover that. I'm going to have some thoughts about that because, quite frankly, I would love to teach. I could teach a law school course on, um, I could teach a law school course on uh, trial advocacy. How to be a good lawyer in trial on this trial. And I... I'm really tempted to be like, let's look at some U.S. trials and we'll just talk about trial advocacy and talk about this. And like, let's watch some of the moments in the depth trial. Let's watch some of the moments. But like, I could do one just on this trial where it's just like, let's watch this. She's really explaining what happened and being clear. There's one moment, one moment that she just screws up. And we're going to talk about that too. But otherwise, she does really well. This is Ms. Gutierrez talking about um, her bringing these dummy rounds on set. I had a multitude of the ones with holes and the ones that you shake. So yeah, and I checked those all and I put them into two things. And then we start talking about boxes. Obviously, when she says things, she's talking about boxes. They usually had I've gotten old fashioned now. <laughs> this is one my dad sent me and mine are usually beat up pretty bad. Like they're very dirty and gross. She's talking about the box and the styrofoam insert. The box and the styrofoam insert she's saying are dirty. Hers, the ones that she brings on set are dirty. They're not new and clean like some of the other ones. Detective Hancock asks her, this is the one that was or handed that you guys had said that you had pulled from. This is that moment in that interview where Ms. Gutierrez has already shown Hancock the photo from her dad. And an hour or two later, Detective Hancock decides that now is the time to show her the photo of the box of dummies she was pulling from that day. And it won't surprise you to learn they're a spot on match. 
Um, so it's been suggested that I mention again, I, if you are in the Vancouver and this is Vancouver, Canada, Vancouver, British Columbia, um, if you are in the Vancouver area, I am going to be at the, um, I'm going to be at the craft. It's posted on my Twitter, um, at March 8th. So two days from now at eight o'clock until probably until they kick us out. So, um, you are welcome to come join me and just hang out. Um, there is no cost other than the, like other than whatever the bar charges you, right? There's, I'm not, I'm not charging anybody any money. I'm not anything. So um, you got, yes, 8 PM. We're not going to a bar at 8 AM. So um, 8 PM, I'm not charging you anything. Of course, like drinks, food, all of those things. If you want to eat them, drink them, etc. you know, um, but yeah, I'll just be there and you can come say hi, come hang out. Um, if nobody shows up, I'm going to be drinking alone, but, um, it'd be good to, good to see some people. So, all right, uh, let's keep going. Do I need a license to attend? No, but it's at a bar. So gotta be, um, of age, I assume. You have the styrofoam insert. From that box of dummies local time so vancouver time we gave it to you so that you can actually look at it in real time and not look at a photograph is because it's kind of dirty and gross it kind of fair fits exactly the way that she described it but there are some characteristics of this styrofoam insert that are going to become more important uh craft bar downtown it's posted to my twitter so any, check that out any suggestion by the defense that somehow the box of dummy craft. rounds that ms gutierrez said she was pulling from was swapped out with something different uh, is absolute nonsense. First of all, you know that because you can see the live rounds. If you don't think you can see them on the 10th and you don't think you can see them on the 13th and you don't think you can see them on the 15th, you know you're looking at one on the 17th and 18th. You know you are. Damn, that's good delivery. That is really solid delivery. If you don't see one on this day, if you don't see it on this day, if you don't see it on this day, you see it here. She's got the pattern. Um, she's got a really good pattern. I, I, yeah. So where's, where does the sabotage theory go then? The 17th and 18th, the camera crew hadn't quit yet. Mr. Norvell wasn't on set poking around on the, on the prop cart. Mr. Halls hadn't had an opportunity to, to spend any time with the gun. They move directly from that cart right into Lieutenant Benavides's patrol unit. They go from that patrol unit right into evidence at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department. And on November 9th of 2021, Anna Gutierrez shows Detective Hancock, now Corporal Hancock, the box of dummies that she and her dad have. And if you listen to Mr. Kenny's testimony, what you understand is that the ammunition from the previous set, that being the old way, Hannah brought leftover dummies from that movie onto the set of Rust. And those 45 long Colt dummy rounds were provided by Thel Reed. Boom. You see the story there. You see the storyline. And you can also see why Hannah was unwilling. Um, and Vez, um, if you can find a way to get me to uh, do a presentation to your class, I'll, I'll make it out there. Um, you can see how she does this, you know, this whole story of this bullet and until it eventually ends up in evidence. But the whole thing about we think that this came from Thel Reed. Now, I'm just going to say, Hannah was offered, we know that Hannah was offered a deal because Bowles told us that. Bowles said this. And Hannah was offered a deal where if she were to have given up the, the source of the live ammo, that they would have cut her a break. They would have cut her a break if she'd told them. And this suggests that the deal would have pointed directly to dad. And why else wouldn't she do it? Who like, do you think she likes Seth Kenny enough to protect Seth Kenny? I don't think so. Right. I don't think she, she likes Seth Kenny at all. Dad, on the other hand is 81. She doesn't want dad to be, cause you know, that deal would have just would have not just included tell us but would have also included testify to it and you know 
you know that they would have said Thel Reed is now going to be on trial. He's going to be facing this charge again as well. And how do you think Thel Reed does if he gets a year in prison at 81? Probably not well, right? Probably not well. So, and this is also why, um, this is also why we don't see Hannah testify and why we don't see Thel testify because they have boxed them out. They just, they're not going to be able to, uh, to testify. What you are looking at in this photo is this styrofoam insert. This is the styrofoam insert that had the live round in it. This is the styrofoam insert that came out of the box labeled 45 long Colt dummies with the JS in the middle. And I love like, she's not just using the picture. She's showing the evidence. She's, you know, yeah. Now let's put it together. Our original evidence photo up here from October 10th, you can see this distinct uh, sort of cut in the styrofoam on that insert that is sitting on her leg on the 10th. You can see that the hole in the styrofoam in the second to the right at the top is dirty. You can see a little bit of grime. I love how she's there. matching these and things up, right? And you can look at it closer. You're gonna see that there's some damage to the styrofoam separators between these two holes. And what do you know? It's right there. She's matching up these two things. There's a little it's bit just of damage to the brilliant. styrofoam separators down here. You can see it in the photo on the right. You can look for yourself. It is right here. And what do you know? That silver primered round from October Tell has no money. Is sitting in the exact um, same Bowles is doing this pro bono. found on October 21st when the sheriff's department collected this box, took it into evidence, and photographed it. Ladies and gentlemen, we call that circumstantial evidence, but that's a mountain of circumstantial evidence. Prop assistant duties versus armor duties on October 21st of 2021. Let's focus on that day. And listen, I'm not here to tell you that Rust Productions did the right thing when they hired on a part-time armorer and asked her to also spend her time doing props. I think everybody who has testified has said that was a really bad idea. And that's probably part of the reason this is the theory is this is the the prosecution but theories that came from Thel. First, this so. was simply not the case. It was not the case on that day. She had three hours in the morning waiting for the camera crew to arrive. She had every opportunity to go through that box of dummies. Gee, that only had like 30 rounds in it. How long does it take to pull the round out of the box, shake it? And if it doesn't shake, look to see if it has a hole in it, put it back in the box and do that to each and every one of them. How long does that exercise take? 10 minutes max. That's not hard. I mean, let's let's try this. And Adam, if that is your dad, that is, uh, I mean, welcome. Um, let's try it. Um, I got 10 dummies here. We're just going to go through them one after. We're going to go through them. Got, got all my dummies in one pocket. So um, somebody with a stopwatch. Oh, we're at. 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59. Starting our timer. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. 10 and we are at 25 seconds um 25 seconds for me to rattle and be sure that each of those was a dummy um now i had 10 dummies right how many did she need to do um six so i feel like you know the minute is like the 10 minutes is um a bit generous. Oh, he changes his name based on the trial of the day. Fair enough. Um, yeah. <sighs> She's got three hours. Can she not get it done? The other thing that is very important is Miss Gutierrez didn't get pulled out of the church because she had to go focus on prop duties. 
she left the gun in the church contrary to all the industry standards uh, for armors on movie sets, for firearm safety on movie sets. And she went back out to her cart so that she could start doing other armor duties. She's getting her fanny pack filled up. Well, we've seen that. She's filling it with blanks. And we know they're about to do a turnaround. They're going to do this, this, uh, quick, this quick insert with Baldwin. And then they're going to do the shoot scene, the, the, the gunfire scene where they're using blanks and the law enforcement have come into the church and there's a shootout. So she goes to get ready for it. She just leaves the gun in there. As you heard from many witnesses, she would leave guns unattended all the time. There was nothing unusual about October 21st that caused her to be unable to stay in the church to properly perform her duties. She leaves the gun. She goes back out because for some reason, with the three hours of, uh, of free time that she had in the morning, she did. I'm sorry, but I got to do it. It's not unusual to leave guns unattended. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just got stuck in my head right there. She didn't get her fanny pack filled up. She didn't get herself ready for that turnaround. So she leaves the gun. Everybody's heard, armors don't leave the gun. Now, let's move over to our tampering with evidence charge. How Now, I'm just going to start another timer here. Um... So tampering of evidence charge, we are at 56 minutes and 40 seconds. Let's move over to our tampering with evidence charge. How is getting rid of a bag of cocaine tampering with evidence related to involuntary manslaughter? Well, on October 21st, 2021, the shooting occurs, the incident occurs. Um, Ms. Gutierrez understands that someone has been seriously injured. She does not yet know that that person is not going to live or has already died. She gets interviewed at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. I will say, surprisingly, two occasions after this incident where a helicopter had to come in, ambulances had to come in, um, Ms. Gutierrez on two occasions after that incident spoke about her concerns about her career. Wow, that gives you an idea that you are dealing with someone who is not particularly concerned about the health and safety of others. And her job Damn. is to be concerned about the health and safety of others. But on that day, damn, she's just thinking about herself. She's put a lady in the hospital, a man in the hospital. She asks to be escorted to the bathroom. Corporal Hancock agrees to do that. And we have her on video on the way there expressing dismay about how this will affect her career. Ouch. After the interview, Hannah goes back to her hotel. Rebecca Smith goes to Hannah's room. She's been summoned by some other folks to try to sort of sit and visit and give Hannah some support. So Rebecca Smith goes to her room and Rebecca Smith is the person that tells Hannah that Helena Hutchins has now died. And you have to understand, in the mind of Hannah Gutierrez, this investigation went from this big to this big because the difference between shooting someone and them living and shooting someone and them dying is it's a huge. really, really big difference. So she is told by Rebecca Smith, investigation just got giant and very, very serious. So after receiving that information, she offloads this bag of cocaine to Rebecca Smith. Rebecca Smith is a lady that's lived a life. She's used cocaine before, many years previous, but she's used cocaine. She knows what it looks like. She knows how it's packaged. And because she's a former addict, she tosses it in a trash can. When Mr. Bowles gets up here and says, I can't prove to you that it's cocaine, remember that when people destroy evidence to avoid prosecution, you don't have the evidence that they destroyed. They got rid of it. So I don't have to prove to you by some scientific uh, uh, we did. drug test. I don't have to send that to the lab and get it tested. It's gone. That's the point to the charge. Now. Okay, that's three minutes. Now, I'm running this at one and a half speed. So let's say five minutes. She spends five minutes on the whole, on the whole thing, right? that that's it um this i think is really a sacrificial charge and we'll talk about that when we get to the verdict let me let me digress a little bit and and run through a couple of things with you what's all this testimony about this inertia puller and how's that play into everything well as you heard from mr haig an inertia puller is a device designed for one task it disassembles live rounds that's what it does. Somehow I think the defense got confused about what our potential theory was that we- It also disassembles inert rounds, potentially. 
we had a theory that Ms. Gutierrez was turning dummy rounds into live rounds. That was never our theory because that would require quite a bit of equipment. There's no question. But to do the reverse is a whole lot easier. So if you're out of dummy rounds or you're running low on dummy rounds and you've got some live rounds around, you could probably turn a dummy round, I'm sorry, you could turn a live round into a dummy round in five minutes. Why does an armor on a movie set bill for an inertia puller? Well, obviously she had one. <laughs> now let's talk about the right? inertia investigation. Now the thing is, is that I have another possibility, right? I think there's another possibility on this one, which is that it might be, um, it might be the issue um, that um, it might be that she was making dummies out of live rounds. That is possible. The other thing is the other possibility that occurs to me because she orders the inertia puller like midway through. And it occurs to me that there's the possibility that she finds a live round on this set. And that once she finds the live round, that she takes it apart in order to investigate it and to go, wait, what the hell? But then the problem would be that she doesn't tell anybody. Like she suspects that she's got a live round. And I think what happened is she found a round and went, this is weird. This does not match any of my dummies. It doesn't, it isn't an apparent dummy. I need to check this out. Um, she could have just been scamming her employer. It's an $18. Like it's, I can buy an 18, like an inertia puller for 20 bucks. Um, if you're going to run a scam, it's all of the dumb things to so I think the prosecution's wrong about this. I think the prosecution is, I think the, I th my suspicion is that she found a live round and didn't tell anybody and was just like, oh shit. So yeah, that that's my theory. I can't prove it. I don't know. Like, it's just, this is my supposition, but uh, <laughs> Roxy, oh my God, go to bed already. We love you so much. I'm going to sleep tonight. So hand loaders and a lot of equipment. The problem is they just didn't find a hand loader. So that's going to be the issue on that. So unless she removed a hand puller, we don't know. So. OSHA doesn't find any wrongdoing with individual employees, only employers. That's their job. They're just an agency that maintains workplace safety. Mr. Genoway confirmed when he was on the witness stand, it's true, his memory was a little bad and Mr. Lewis had to refresh it for him, but he confirmed that Hannah's conduct on the set contributed. I'm just going to hide myself here, I think, or move myself. Yeah, there we go. So you can read this. Contributed to their findings that this was not a safe workplace. Please keep in mind that the OSHA investigation is not a criminal investigation. Critically and surprisingly, OSHA never interviewed Gabrielle Pickle. This is critically important because if, if they had interviewed her, they would have known the following things. Hannah was granted 10 armor days out of the 12 filming days, not eight. That was right there in the cell phone records. The training days when Ms. Gutierrez is, is sending those messages saying, I want more training time, training days. She's not saying these actors, these adults need more training time. She specifically requested additional training time to train the child and it was refused because first of all, it's a major liability issue. And second of all, the child was never going to fire a gun. So when she asked for the additional training days, they were denied. That's not the reason Helena Hutchins is dead. Keep in mind. Her hair has gotten a little messed up by the glasses going on. And it kind of looks like the Grinch's hair now. <laughs> and Gabrielle Pickle uh, had a meeting with Hannah and offered her additional assistance so that she would be able to perform her duties effectively. That's a fair she point. Assistance uh, from some of the other folks there on set. This is a fair point. A puller could also be used to fix a dummy cartridge that has been dropped or damaged and the bullet is sunk down into the case. So, um, you know, let me just embiggen a little bit again. Um, these dummy rounds, by the way, are the best purchase I've made, you know, for this trial. Um, so let's say you've got this, right? And let's say it gets smacked and the bullet, this 
the lead part here could actually get pushed into the the casing. You could use an inertia puller to to fix that and to remove it. That is a possibility. You know who could have told us what purpose she was using the inertia puller for? Um, Hannah could have gotten up on the stand to testify, this is why I had the inertia puller. But she'd have to get up on the stand. And yeah. Beats Rando saying, so nobody used guns after hours for target practice? No. The prosecution even said that is not what happened. You may have heard this rumor, but it didn't happen. So, yeah. To try to give her some relief. And keep in mind that on a movie set, the armorer has autonomy with regard to gun safety. God, no. Most the, the, accused the people are guilty. That oh. Rust Productions failed to properly supervise her is surprisingly incorrect because the armorer has no supervisor when it comes to weapons and gun safety on the movie set. Mr. Halls is just there to be a second pair of eyes. That's it. That said, he sucked at that. Um, should, couldn't she just tell her lawyer to say that? Um, the problem is that, that wouldn't be in evidence. They'd have to get that in evidence somehow. And I think that they could have suggest they could have inquired about this possibility with the experts but the problem is is that not having inquired about it not having got that evidence out there um they're done uh so why didn't you charge him they they did charge him they um uh halls took a plea deal he got now, probation i think there can be no question that rust productions was more than negligent when they hired Ms. gutierrez because she was not anywhere close to being qualified for this job In fact, if you recall, Gabrielle Pickle, to her credit, tried to get Ms. Gutierrez to implement a check-in and check-out system because two people had complained that there was a shotgun left unattended. People on the set were complaining about her. They went to production and said, hey, she's not supposed to do that. You can't just leave real guns laying around. So I could tell you, I would have gone freaking nuclear. Um, I would have gone freaking nuclear. Like, sorry, no. <laughs> there's a gun at the um there's a gun just lying at the craft table are you kidding me oh so gabrielle pickle goes to hannah gutierrez asks for a check-in check-out system hannah gutierrez says no hannah gutierrez says it's too difficult it's too much trouble gabrielle pickle didn't prevent her from um i think safe. it's the same charge in that instance she did the opposite she tried to improve firearm safety on the set but keep in mind the armor has autonomy so Gabrielle Pickle is not Hannah Gutierrez's boss when it comes to firearm safety. Ms. Gutierrez gets to do what she wants. Now I can only imagine that after Hey, if somebody wants to cast cases, me, I'd, uh, I'd be down. So the defense has taken a shotgun approach to this case. Seth Kinney is to blame. Well, no evidence of that. Sarah Zachary is to blame. No evidence of that. Dave Halls is to blame. He shouldn't have taken the gun from her. Um, and he didn't do a good safety check. Well, she is the autonomous decision maker with regard to gun safety. It's not that Dave Halls shouldn't have taken the gun from her. It's that she shouldn't have given him the gun. And then By the way, um, do you get the feeling here that she wrote this, scripted this out? Like she's actually written a script here and she has practiced this. This isn't the first time she's delivered this speech. She has done this over and over and over again in the mirror um until she's got it really well done right this is this is practice this is the this is the theater of the courtroom and yeah and turned around and walked away uh the defense alec baldwin is to blame for acting like a prima donna on the movie set and bossing people around this is hollywood for heaven's sakes i would imagine that's relatively common don't get me wrong I'm not saying that his conduct was right. I am the person who indicted him. <laughs> I love this. It's Hollywood. Of course, there are going to be a-holes. Everyone in Hollywood is going to be an a-hole because it's Hollywood. And But she says, I'm not cutting him a pass. He's getting charged too, right? Um, what is it? 
So Saul Goodman rehearsing in the men's room in one of the beginning scenes is actually very legit. I can tell you, I have never rehearsed in the crap room. I don't rehearse in the bathroom. And part of that is that I don't want to rehearse in a situation where somebody might overhear it. I also don't find it to be very useful to rehearse in front of a mirror. Uh, if I am, when I was it, recently in a trial and I was practicing my closing, I didn't rehearse in front of a camera. Like I've got camera equipment. I can see myself. It's real easy. Like if I want to see myself, um, boom, there I am. I can rehearse in front of me and that's real easy. I don't do that typically. What I do is I drive my wife absolutely bonkers by pacing around and I will practice a lot in my head. I can, I do fairly well just like thinking through it. Um, but I pace when I do it and that drives my wife nuts a little bit. Um, I practice thinking through it in the car and my wife will be like, I'm, I'm not talking, but she's like, what do you, what speech are you practicing in your head right now? And I'm like, I'm practicing a, a, a closing. And every once in a while, I'll practice out loud wandering around, right? But I just, a lot of my practice is mental practice, like I'm rolling through it. Um, yeah. So uh, I can tell you, my wife, when I'm driving, um, I'll, I, I do a lot of my... Um, when I go on a long drive, I'm almost always thinking of like a case or something like that, um, just in my head and just to, you know, to do that. So um, once in a while, I'll say it out loud. But yeah, somebody says, when are we going to uh, when are we going to meet Mrs. Runkle? Uh, she doesn't usually sort of come on stream. She might decide to come out to the meet on um, to the meet and greet on Friday, but she probably won't. Alec Baldwin's conduct and his lack of gun safety inside that church on that day is something that he's going to have to answer for. Not with you and not today. That'll be with another jury on another day. Brian Norvell, the gentleman who goes and gets the prop cart and wheels it over and then puts his hand over the crime scene tape and picks up that dummy round and shakes it. You heard Mr. Bowles ask some questions that, 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 that are intended to make people think that uh, Mr. Norvell either took something off the prop cart or planted something on the prop cart. Well, keep in mind, <coughs> he doesn't have to plant live rounds because we've seen from the photographic evidence, those are there, they're floating around already. Um, so <laughs> live rounds were on set. They were not planted by, by Brian Norvell. But this man is not a mystery to the state or the defense. Yes, she's going to be in I Vancouver. I made him come in and sit down for a one and a half hour interview. So but she may not come to the meet. Any questions they wanted, and they asked him none, not a single question. So what that means is that this is just all smoke and mirrors and deflection. They don't want the truth. We know the truth. You have seen it throughout this trial. And I will remind you that during one of the heated objection exchanges between myself and Mr. Bowles, you heard Mr. Bowles cry out that he was looking for the truth. Listen, I can bring a horse to water, but I cannot make him drink. If you want... <laughs> I would have objected. I would have objected and said, that's not evidence. That's not proper to bring before a jury. I would have objected at this point. Um, I would have. And do you think defense is writing his closing right now? He shouldn't be. He really shouldn't be writing his closing right now. I don't think that, um, I don't think he's writing his closing right now. But I got to tell you, as I'm usually defense like i'm defense counsel right that's what i do i've never been a prosecutor right um i have never been uh, a prosecutor at all but one of one of the things you have to do when you're preparing your closing is the prosecutor you know the crown in canada um they deliver their clothes first and you better be adjusting your clothes to fit theirs right you can't just write your clothes and be like it's good that's it. You adjust your clothes. And so I hope that's what he's doing right now. Um, I hope that's what he's up to. The truth. I'll bring the guy in. I'll make him available for you to talk to. Ask him some questions. Not a single one. That's brutal. No questions asked. And they say it's this camera is... crew. You mean the people who believed that safety on set was being compromised to such a degree that they left? <laughs> that decision may very well that's have saved a... their lives. 
this is so good. So good. I really. So. Guys, I'm a defense lawyer. I am. I'm biased against prosecutors, typically. Like, I I usually, I'm in, on the side of the accused person, almost always. Um, I'm usually on the side of the accused person. And I am really glad she's not a prosecutor in my area. Because if she was a prosecutor in my area, I would be scared. <laughs> I There are some prosecutors in my area who I just... So I'm going to tell you a story about a guy who's now retired. I'm blanking on his name. Um, I was in... Uh, I'm going to embiggen myself for this. Um, this prosecutor was... Um, you know, this prosecutor was, uh, I don't think he was the chief prosecutor, but he was like the assistant chief. And he was in low complexity court teaching uh, a young lawyer, like a young prosecutor, how to do it. And the way he was teaching this young prosecutor is that they were alternating days. So every other day, it would be either the young prosecutor running trials or this very senior prosecutor. Um, I've never been a prosecutor. I've only been defense. So, um, so what ends up happening is that um, I, I get there and it's the senior prosecutor is running the trials that day. And I go to him and I say, listen, I think, I think that this is a case that you, I don't think you're going to win it. And I, I was pretty confident. And he looks at me and he says, watch me. He did such a good job. He was a really excellent prosecutor. And I can tell you, he kicked my ass. Like straight up, he kicked my ass. And I learned things. I learned things from this you know, from that loss, but he absolutely trounced me in that trial. Um, I don't want to encounter him again. And thankfully he's now retired. She is scarier than he was. The $60,000 question in this case, who brought the live rounds on set? You know the answer to that. I know the answer to that. I'm not telling you that Hannah Gutierrez intended to bring live rounds on set. I'm telling you that she was negligent. She was careless. She was thoughtless. She brought them on set. And you know from the testimony you heard. Never saw her shake a dummy round. Dave Halls never saw her shake a dummy round. She didn't shake those dummy rounds. Nobody For saw her. Know, those dummy rounds were floating around the set of the old way. And Nicolas Cage is lucky to have walked away with his life. This is a good question. Uh, Runkle of the Bailey, when you start your trial, do you know what your closing argument will be about? You start here with opening and you end here with closing. When I start my trial, I have an idea of what I want my clothes to look like. I haven't written my clothes yet because we haven't heard the evidence. But um, uh, but I have an idea. I, I, I have a roadmap for where I want to be. But my actual clothes has to be based on where, you know, where I end up. So um, as a defense lawyer, would you take this case? Yeah. I'd, I've taken cases that were even bigger losers than this one. So, hate to imagine what happened with your client. Um, client got some jail time. Don't feel too bad. <laughs> don't feel too bad. Um, my client, I don't, like, you never know for certain, but, yeah. Um I'm going to go back and that Who brought the library. So the $60,000 question in this case, who brought the live rounds on set? You know, the answer to that. I know the answer to that. I'm not telling you that Hannah Gutierrez intended to bring live rounds on set. I'm telling you that she was negligent. She was careless. She was thoughtless. She brought them on set. And you know, from the testimony you heard, Sarah Zachary never saw her shake a dummy round. 
Dave Halls never saw her shake a dummy round. She didn't shake those dummy rounds. Yes, but you don't know how it's going to... rounds were floating around the set of the old way, and Nicolas Cage is lucky to have walked away with his life. <laughs> I thought the evidence was to be disclosed to you before trial. We get the evidence on paper, but you don't actually know how the witnesses are going to be, right? You can have, like, this witness... Um, you can have something that says, this witness says he saw your client, you know, breaking into a place. Um, well, how good are they going to be? Like, when I cross-examine them, are they going to be excellent? Are they going to be weak? Are they... Yeah. How do lawyers switch between prosecution and defense? Is it a choice to specialize in one or the other? Can any lawyer be a prosecutor for a specific case, even if they're defense? Usually, usually it's that they have their standard prosecutor. She's a defense lawyer normally, and they brought her in specially for this. So she's normally a defense lawyer. So why does it matter that she brought What's the Nicolas Cage thing about? Okay, we'll do a brief rundown of the Nick Cage thing. So, uh, the old way it was a movie that Hannah Gutierrez was the armor on. She's it's the it's the only other armor credit that she's got. Uh, Nick Cage was the actor in that movie, and Nick Cage hates Hannah Gutierrez. Hates Hannah Gutierrez. Why does he hate Hannah Gutierrez? Well, because at several points during that film, uh, Hannah had. Uh, blanks going off that um, without any announcement, without any sort of like warning, um, without any sort of warning at all to say like, hey, um, we're about to have live fire. And so Nick Cage didn't have his hearing protection in. He wasn't ready for it. Um, you know, on films, a lot of the scenes where there's guns being fired they have ear protection in and you just can't see the ear protection because of the angles of the shot. And also because of sometimes they have to edit it out. Right. Nick Cage lost his shit on Hannah. He yelled at her. He just lost his shit at Hannah and Nick Cage was super pissed at her. And from what I've heard through the grapevine, I'm not naming any sources here, but I have heard that Nick Cage has a grudge, like that Nick Cage does not like Hannah Gutierrez and that Nick Cage basically would not have, would have advocated that she never work again, like would have basically spread the word. And Nick Cage has... Like, he's got gas in Hollywood. He's not just some rando, right? He's not like whatever else. Um, you know, Nick Cage says, don't hire this, you know, this young, what, you know, young, inept, whatever. Um, she probably doesn't get hired. So, um, yeah, Nick Cage, from what I've heard, and again, I can't tell sources and I'm just relaying things that are, you know, that were heard. But apparently Nick Cage is, yeah, this is a good comment here. Nick Cage is probably watching this eating popcorn like Michael Jackson in the Thriller video. Yeah, just like, oh boy, um, like you're going down. Uh, Nick Cage and Jensen Ackles were going to make sure she never worked in the industry again anyway, but I agree with the verdict wholeheartedly. Oh, Jensen Ackles also appears to be pissed. And this just tells us that like, Nick Cage and Jensen Ackles are good people. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to like uh, people keep asking me, like, if you could interview anybody, who would you interview? And like my top five include Keanu Reeves, um, who is probably my top one. Um, but also like Jensen Ackles would make the list. So. Brought live rounds on set. It goes to foreseeability. She had six, six live rounds on that movie set. The earliest date that I can track them for you is October 10th. We know that they were there from the 10th to the 21st, six, and she failed to ferret them out for 12 days. What that means is that she wasn't Jesus. taking any dummy rounds. She wasn't testing anything. None of that stuff that her lawyer no, he won't think be. was so difficult. It was no, none of it was happening. It didn't happen the entire time. 
I mean, theoretically, he could be called to say, like, uh, you know, that Hannah is so awful. Um, I don't think we're going to see Nick Cage there. Um, yeah. So, KVB, I would love to talk to some of these people, but I, I, I know you probably can't make that happen. But if you can, let me know. <laughs> Shouldn't find any of them. And folks, if and she's not checking the dummy ammunition during the pendency of the filming to make sure that those rounds that are designed to look like live rounds are in fact dummy rounds, this was a game of Russian roulette every time an actor had a gun with dummies. Who? Who? And this is the thing, right? If you um if you're checking the dummies every time you use them, eventually you should catch the live rounds and filter them out, but also stop everything and inventory and figure things out. But she never did that. These things were just floating around, moving around, you know? Yeah. Sadly for Ms. Hutchins, her camera crew walked off set that morning and that required her to go into the church and operate the camera herself. Oh, a lot of times. And that's what she was doing when the live round that Ms. Gutierrez put in Mr. Baldwin's gun was expelled from that firearm and went all the way through her body. No one told Ms. Gutierrez to leave the church. No one called her out of the church. There wasn't a COVID protocol in place that prevented her from being in the church at that moment. You know from the... You could tell that she is, you know... She's like, just like, let's cross everything out. But she's telling it in the form of a story. Production outfit or videos, she didn't care about her job. She let it all go. Mr. Bowles is going to argue to you that if, if Mr. Halls had just called Ms. Gutierrez back into the church, she would have done an additional safety check and that live round would have been found. Well, for heaven's sakes, we all know that if she had been called back into the church for an additional safety check, nothing would have changed. <laughs> safety checks didn't consist of pulling the dummy rounds out of the cylinder, shaking them in front of the actor and the assistant director, showing them that they're dummy rounds and putting them back in. No one ever saw her do that one single time, even though that's industry standard. And the reason it's industry standard is because you can't tell a dummy round by simply spinning a cylinder and looking at the primers unless they are dummy rounds without primers. And that's kind of an interesting fact. We know that six dummy rounds without primers were not loaded into that weapon because one of them turned out to be live and very clearly had a primer. Interestingly though, she had five dummy rounds without primers in her pocket, in her pocket. All she had to do was put those in the gun, make sure that the sixth one either rattles or has a hole in it and she's good to go. Because now when you look, when the cylinder gets spun, you can see five of them without taking them out. That they don't have primers they were in her pocket and she didn't use them oh my god she is like it is her job right now her job is to commit murder and she is straight up committing a murder um she is straight up committing a murder and uh, like, Bowles is just having a bad day. This is this is good. Um, this is really good. I am good. going to have another opportunity to speak with you. And when I speak with you uh, last, it won't be as long, I promise. Um, and we will talk about some of our jury instructions then. But I do want to address some of the testimony from, the, from Dr. Gerald from OMI. Uh, because Mr. Bowles is likely to make an argument that there was some sort of medical negligence uh, that contributed to Ms. H to, to Ms. Hutchins' death. And I want to talk to you a little bit about Dr. Gerald's testimony. The other thing that is important is negligence, like medical negligence that contributes to someone's death is largely irrelevant. So as an example, let's say I, you know, let's say I shoot somebody on the street, right? Bang, they are shot, they go down. And let's say that my shot, they would have lived. I shot them in the knee, right? And then the, um, you know, the ambulance rolls up. 
this guy's been shot in the knee, but he's going to live, right? Because it's just the knee. You Knees are important, but you can live without a knee. And let's say the ambulance rolls up and they intend to inject the person with like, you know, a little painkiller, right? Because you need some when you got shot in the knee, right? You need some painkillers after that. Um, I wouldn't want to get shot in the knee with no painkillers. I wouldn't want to get shot in the knee at all. But but let's say that instead of, you know, let's say the proper dose is, you know, 10 milligrams. And instead they inject 10 grams of opiates. And so instead of like, hey, this person is having like, you know, some pain you know, pain reduction, they just get dead. Like, and the dead is that medical negligence. Well, I'm still going to be on the hook because they wouldn't have gotten injected with that but for my having shot the person. I am still a substantial contributing cause to their death. And I could be charged with that. So don't shoot people, even in the knee, because you could end up with, you know, it could go real bad. Don't shoot people. Um, that is legal advice. No shooting people. Here are the lethal injuries. The lethal injuries. Blood loss from, from the wound. That was the primary lethal in injury. Her blood was leaking into her in, into her abdominal cavity, and a lot of it. And you saw those photographs. You saw the photographs of her clothing. There was a lot of blood. So why is she hearkening back to the photos? Because the photos are going to be like we didn't see that. The jury saw that, and the jury is going to be like, "Oh my god, don't make us think about those pictures because we hate those pictures, and because we hate those pictures." We will, yeah, um, we'll have opinions on that. So the first lethal injury that comes from the gunshot is blood loss associated with it. And the second one, if you recall from Dr. Gerald, uh, the, the wound to the, to the lung was also a lethal wound. Keep in mind, that bullet went into her body. It went through her rib. It severed her spinal cord. It punctured her lung. It came out the back of her shoulder. And a few hours later, Ms. Gutierrez is telling Corporal Hancock that she's worried about her career. If you think that person would have done a satisfactory safety check if she had been called back to the church, I am here to tell you that I strongly disagree. the astonishing lack of diligence with regard to gun safety is without question a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. Did Mr. Baldwin also contribute when he pointed the gun at people and pulled the hammer back and regardless of what he said to George Stephanopoulos, pulled the trigger? Yes, he is. I love the little like George Stephanopoulos reference. And again, we'll deal with that another time. You don't escape accountability when you load a live round into a prop gun, tell the crew that it has dummy rounds in it, hand it off to an actor and leave the room because he manipulated it. That's the whole point. That was the whole point to him having it. Of course he was going to manipulate it. It's foreseeable. Everything is so completely foreseeable. Imagine I hand you a gun and I tell you that it's basically empty and I walk away when in fact, I put live ammunition in it. Do you think an accident might happen? You think that accident is foreseeable? And listen, let's remember some of the testimony from Mr. Carpenter. Control is how we enforce gun safety. We do it with control. When she loses control, which she did repeatedly, anything goes. Anything goes there. I really find this to be effective. I am going to complete the majority of the portion of my closing arguments with regard to the facts. The next portion will be with regard to the law. When I come back after Mr. Bowles has had an opportunity to address you, uh, we will be asking for justice today for Helena Hutchins. Thank you. 
Okay. Well, if it's about a bathroom break, we're going to take a bathroom break. Okay. okay. So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Thank you. We May we approach um, just to take a, a, a crap break? Like, that was not necessary. That was... Now, that was a really good, really good close. I really thought that close was good. Um, the problem that she had during the close is there is a moment where she gets some dates wrong and the defense does nothing with it. The defense corrects her and then just leaves it. I would have asked for a jury instruction as to the correction. Like, oh my God, I would have asked for a jury, like a correct, like a, yeah, but we don't get that. Um, so there's a break, and then we're going to jump to defense close. Bowles is going to try to, you know, get this um, together. Uh, I'm going to go through some super chats here. Ali Foley, thank you so much for the new membership. Rainman YYC, thank you so much for the gifted membership. Carson Pratt, uh, thanks for all your great coverage of this trial. Thank you. LK, thank you for the YouTube membership. Uh, my Louisa dog. Thank you so much. Uh, C Bumper, welcome aboard. Jade, I had two lives in a week. 1.30 a.m. UK, needs sleep. I need some sleep. Lawyer, you know, was like, I'm going right into the trial of um, the Crumblies, like the, the, the male Crumbly. And I was like, my dude, I don't know how you do it because I got to sleep. I agree with the verdict. Don't agree with the remand. We're going to talk about the remand. We're, I, I have some opinions on it. Vez from Quebec, just saying right now I'm spoiler free, so I'm here to learn for all of it. Off to vote for Rick. Thank you so much, Vez. Uh, M Technician 1K, could she write a book and profit from it after this judgment? I know uh, M1 is a no, but you're not sure now. I don't think she can, but I'm not sure. I'd have to research that, I'm afraid. Jen Edwards and Leonidas the Kitty, sending love to Fiona W. on the loss of their cat. I can tell you every time I've lost a pet, it has left me kind of broken for like a week. And every once in a while, I think a little bit about, um, uh, every once in a while, I think a bit about like, what do I do when Potter passes or Zora passes? And I don't like those thoughts. Um, Jay Baffo says, I thought Camille and Ben were way overrated. Other attorneys on televised trials have been overrated. Of course, some are embarrassing, but this prosecutor is what I'm used to in real life. This prosecutor is better than most of the prosecutors I've dealt with. So, um, yeah. Uh, Miss Kimi, I think. Uh, welcome aboard. Thank you so much. Sally Dragon, welcome aboard. Uh, Kaylee H., what percentage of time does she have to serve? Um, we don't know what time she's getting, so I'm not sure. Kyle Stark, thank you for the gifted membership. Much appreciated. Against the Tide, please like to help Ian reach his pro bono goals. That is, I want to be a free lawyer. Um, Ryan's Hex RN, thank you so much for the YouTube membership. Angelica Roland, thank you so much. Uh, John Komen, I was okay with either verdict. She is guilty, but I think other people were also responsible for set safety who are not criminally charged. A not guilty would have felt like a good, strong F you to production. Yeah. Um, Except the production doesn't care at the end of the day. Uh, DJ D not calling Thel Reed surprising or no? I think the prosecution boxed Thel Reed out. I don't think he was likely to testify because he was in a position where if he did, they were going to hammer him with some really tough questions. Mashed Potato Goblin. What was the jury question about? We'll get to that. Priscilla Stevenson. Thank you so much. Uh, Christy Richardson. Boom. First Runkle Super Chat. Thank you so much. Thanks for your expertise on this case. Now go get some rest and enjoy time off. Um, I'm going to be traveling next. You know how that goes for me. Uh, what would closing look like? Well, we've seen one closing. Uh, lawyer, you know, said Bowles had been a federal prosecutor. That's, I believe that's on his resume. That was the first I'd heard of it. He was apparently a very bad prosecutor, if it's true. He might be a really good prosecutor. I don't know. Different skill set. Coffee the cra for the crazy. <laughs> Love the name. Thank you so much. I have questions. Thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. Cat in Virginia, this closing argument reminds me of the game Clue, um, except that we're now actually getting some answers. 
Rainman YYC, thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. DSN, thank you for the gifted membership. Rainman YYC, hey all, vote for Hogue for Stroke Hero. Vote Cthulhu for everything else. Love it. Brentwood Sheik, thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. Alicia Vasquez, got to head out early, but looking forward to do the, doing this with uh, y'all again in the summer. Yep, I'm going to be covering Baldwin. So, Joy W101, this timeline with the dummies and live rounds wasn't made clear through the body of the trial. You can't really. You can only ask witnesses what they see, and it's the prosecution that did all the stitching together. So, tough cookie. Thank you for the five gifted memberships. But the prosecution made it possible to stitch all that together. That's where they did a really good job. Uh, Apple Silver says, at least grab a live round and make it fair. I'd have to go into the other room. Um, Radio Man S3, what do you call it when uh, Runkle makes fun of Miss Hannah Gutierrez? Filing a motion to dismiss. <laughs> Mama Mimi, uh wonder why we didn't hear from Mr. Reed. Thoughts? I don't think he would like the questions he'd be asked. Apple Silver, is it possible to hand, for hand-loaded ammo to be loaded in any way that could be rattled? Um, you could, but you'd have to intentionally do that. Crazy Cat Queen, how is ineffective defense defined for appeal? Um, worse than this, there have been cases where people have like been sleeping, that kind of thing. Uh, Ariel under the sea, uh, why would a defense attorney become a prosecutor? Um, because they hired her. That's basically it. Morgan, I never leave the house without my pocket bullets. <laughs> Louise Skelly Photography, how did they ensure this movie? Surely you got to ask how many firearms qualifications, etc. No, that's not how Hollywood rolls. Here for years, how would you grade A, B, C, D, or F, the defense prosecution? For me, prosecution, defense, C-. minus. Prosecution, B, I think defense is a D. I, I yeah. Rosebud26, do you think because she's a defense attorney makes her a better prosecution? I think um, I think it is helpful to have done both, or at least to be able to get your mind into the mindset. Lady Draconis, for your Baldwin coverage pro bono fund, thank you so much. And Anna Juice, yay to 260,000. I still haven't done my celebration for 250,000. I had big plans to do a big celebration for that, and I have not done it. So, um, all right, let us roll on. And this is important. Gun injuries are virtually zero in the history of movie sets. So far as I know, I think it's three gun injuries total on the history of movie sets, like three serious gun injuries. And three injuries, there are very little, very few things where there have been three injuries in the history of total, like the history of ever. So the crow is one of them. Um, Mr. Hexum is one of them, and there's one other. Um, there's one other, but guns are basically one of the safest things. And when you actually look at, um, you know, when you look at other things like cars, cars are more dangerous. Uh, horses are more dangerous. Um, elevated anything is more dangerous. Um, like plenty of stunt people die. And yeah, um, majority of injuries on set are helicopter related. That doesn't surprise me. One helicopter crash could take out a lot of people. Um, so yeah. Mr. Bowles. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, please, court, counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. I want to start also as I did when this began, which I want to sincerely thank you for your time and attention uh, and all of your work on this case. It's been hard. It's been a, a long case. And I, I want to thank you first. On behalf of Ms. Gutierrez Reed, who this is extremely important for her, this, this case, and this is her day in court. And it's extremely important that the government rule out every reasonable doubt that there is in this case. Because that. I want to say, I like his opening on this. I like his opening here. He goes, I want to thank you, especially on behalf of Ms. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, because it's very important to her. It's her day in court, and it's important that the prosecution prove everything beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a good intro. I like the intro. Um, I like the intro. Um, somebody says, would I want to be a film armorer? Um, I don't think I would. Um 
I mean, I'm not getting into that business. I'm going to hopefully, hopefully I am going to get my, um, I'm going to get, be getting my business firearms license here in Alberta and my business firearms license. One of the things I put down for it, one of the purposes for my film armor is that I wanted to, to be, or to, for my business firearms license is that I want to be a film armor. And troll, you could take a timeout. <laughs> but the the reason why I want to be a film armor is specifically for YouTube. For for me, I want to armor my own films. Um, so you may see some videos where because I get people who are saying like, "Listen, I you know I want to know if this particular item is prohibited," and I'm like, "I can't do that without the business firearms license." I I think I could do a better job than Hannah Gutierrez Reed, but I, before I could do that, I would want to, you know, something else. Like, I'd want to have some more practice on it. So uh, for those in the chat curious, this set was a checklist of what not to do. It hasn't changed armor practice as much because it was already all the things we do not allow to occur. David Puff says, I'd hire you as armor, Ian. Just got to write a script that requires it. Um, maybe one day, um, one day after I finish writing some of my other projects, I may get around to writing a script. I have a couple of script ideas in my head, but the problem with me writing a script is I know that if I write a script, it will go nowhere. I will never get it made into anything. So that is our standard in this country. Reasonable doubt is a concept, meaning if you have any reasonable doubt, if you have a reasonable doubt, we cannot convict people in this country. That's how it's set up. Because of that, the burden is on the prosecution, always stays in the prosecution. And so they have to rule out all of the reasonable doubts. In this case, this is something you always want to do as a um, you always want to do as a defense lawyer is to emphasize reasonable doubt. And the reason why is because most of the time, um, most of the time, reasonable doubt is is what you're riding on. It's not, you're rarely in a situation where you're saying, I can prove my client is innocent. What you're usually saying is, I am showing that instead, um, you know, that the prosecution hasn't proven this. And dude, the jury just uh, said a 24, 24 year old woman should not be doing this job. This will be the new normal now. I'm sorry. I, Here's the thing. There are tons of 24-year-old women who can do this job. Tons of them. I have watched, you know, young lawyers just absolutely stand their ground in the face of a, an angry, yelling judge and whatever else. Hannah shouldn't do this job. But that isn't to say that there aren't tons of 24-year-old women who are potentially you could. You just got to be, you, yeah. And I'm going to talk about a lot of the evidence soon, but I just want to start with a summary. The prosecutor just presented to you a series of pictures, uh, and those were the pictures they paid the guy $10,000 to enlarge, uh, and they went through the pictures, and they tried to show that there were silver primers, and this is going to be definitive evidence that these live rounds had to be on site at a particular time. Let me tell you why there's reasonable doubt, number one, that they will never be able to rule out in this case. Sarah Zachary threw away rounds. She unquestionably threw away rounds after the shooting. It's undisputed. We have no idea what those look like. We will never have an idea what they look like, and that will never be able to be overcome. That one fact alone prevents that entire picture set up that was just shown to you from being accurate, from being real. Explain. Explain, right? Explain this more, right? Um, tell us how those rounds could have you know, tell us how those rounds could have accomplished reasonable doubt. Like, tell us how they could show this being innocent. And, yeah. Um, baby Johnny, I hear you, but everyone else is not complaining, so I don't know what the issue is. Um, because we have no idea what those other rounds, whether they had silver primers, whether they were dummies, whether they were other types of, of dummies, what they look like. We have no idea. Fact two on the pictures. Seth Kenny told you he had gotten live rounds from Del Reed that went to the 1883 set. 
Those live rounds were three types. There were three types of bullets. He then brought back around 125 of those of the three types. Now, the ones that the state seized, the prosecutors made a point of saying, these don't match the live rounds. However, we don't know what he had because they waited a month to go get them. It was over a month when they searched. And when Mr. Kenny brought in the rounds, he had been talking to the investigator about what was going on in the investigation. So we're never going to have an idea as to what Seth Kenny had. And what explain how this matters. Like explain what Seth Kenny could have had that matters, right? Explain this. The prosecution has done a great job of explaining all of this, right? Of and he doesn't. He just says like, "Oh, they threw out evidence. They threw out bullets. Cool. Tell us why." Um, motorcycle stunt here in Vancouver. Awesome, um, John. Um, if you show up at the um, if you show up at the meet that I'm doing on the eighth at eight o'clock at the craft, I'll buy you a beer. Um, absolutely. What he provided, because he also told you in this trial, he had no inventory system. He had no idea what was coming in and going out of his place. The place was a wreck. We got like a train to hit it. There's no way for somebody to, to really understand what they're putting in, what they're going out. And so he also said there were things that went into the rest set that he had an inventory and hadn't invoiced. He said that there were things that. This would be a great close right here if, if he'd managed to land any of this on Seth Kenny. Like Seth Kenny. You had other ammunition you got rid of, right? You had other ammunition you got rid of. Um, yes, I'll do more meets in the future. I'm going to do one in Edmonton. Um, yeah. Like, you have to say, like, this is why it was so important for them to drill Seth Kenny on cross, and they didn't get a single... They didn't land a single punch on him. They didn't land a single punch on him at all. And so now that they're saying Seth Kenny, it's like, well, why didn't you hit him with that? Um, somebody's saying, am I doing any meetup in Edmonton? I will do a meetup in Edmonton at some point um, soon. I'll, I'll schedule one. So I one day I'll make it out to Vancouver Island. I just, I can't that day. Um, so one day. And people are like, hey, will you come out to Southwest Ohio um, if I'm going to be there? Otherwise, yeah. Um, yes, it is at the craft. Uh, go on my Twitter, which is at Ian Runkle, and you will. Uh, it's the pinned comment. On there that he didn't have invoiced. But here's the problem with that. We do not know that Seth Kenny only had those patinaed rounds. That's reasonable doubt. That's coming right from the government's witnesses, from Mr. Kenny. That part is unreconcilable. There is a reasonable doubt that we'll never leave this case on those two points, on the pictures and the live rounds. Now, Ms. Morrissey... Except that he said that was all I sent was those patinaed rounds. He said those were the only 45 long colt dummies that he sent, and you failed to accomplish anything on that in cross-examination. So, good job, defense. Calls it dishonest for us to raise a question about Mr. Kenny and... I submit it's not dishonest at all because they have the burden to investigate every possibility, uh, every aspect, as anybody in Ms. Gutierrez Reed's place would deserve and would want because their life is on the line as well on felony charges. And it's the government's duty to rule out all these other things. Far from dishonest, what it is, is thoroughness, competence, finding what happened with Seth Kenny, taking his fingerprints, taking his DNA, going. What would have happened with his fingerprints or his DNA, right? Like what would have happened? Um, in a crew group post about the verdict, I saw at least one female armor who posted, not sure of her age, but I hope Hannah Gutierrez Reed doesn't make it. So it's another gender based job in productions, collective mind. And you know what, if that female armor wants to come on the, wants to come on the channel and like talk about that and basically establish like, this isn't a gender thing. This is a competence thing. I would be happy to have her on and say like, let's talk about this. Um, so let her know, like if she wants to get in touch with me and so forth, I would be happy to, you know, to, to do that. Right. So. Through and searching earlier, doing that investigation and finding out if indeed there is. And yeah, KVB studios, same right thing away. for you. And they never wanted to look into because they rushed to judgment on Miss Gutierrez Reed from the very beginning. They singled her out on that set. 
They put her in a cop car, whether she asked or whether they put her in. This uh, is the she thing. Her and she never leaves custody until after her statement. They singled her out and they rushed to judge on her. And that's what you've seen ever since. Ms. Morrissey says a camera crew and she mocks things that we raise as possibilities on the idea that none of it can be possible except Ms. Gutierrez Reed is guilty. That is the only thing. But the problem that they have is if Seth Kenny gave them bad ammo, it was still her job to shake the ammo and to check it. So if she did her job right, it wouldn't have mattered either way. Thing that can be possible because I say it. It's not how it works. So wait, you're saying that they singled out the person whose job is safety for the safety violations? You know, this is like if I'm if I go to the mechanic to get my car fixed and I leave and the brakes don't work and I smash into a pole and I go into the mechanic and I'm like, what the hell, dude? And he's like, oh, sure, blame me just because I'm the mechanic. It's like, yes, that is how this works. That is what is going to happen, right? Like, yes, you are you are who I'm going to blame. Ms. Morrissey said she indicted Mr. Baldwin. I indicted Mr. Baldwin. Actually, I think it's the state of New Mexico. That's not an individual person with that power. Really, dude? Really? Let's listen to this again. This is his big thing. How it works. Ms. Morrissey said she indicted Mr. Baldwin. I indicted Mr. Baldwin. Actually, I think it's the state of New Mexico. Mic drop. <laughs> oh, come. Seriously? Seriously? I think it was the state of New Mexico. Nobody gives a shit, my dude. No, like... This just makes him look like this is the Hurt Feelings Patrol, especially when it comes right after. He's like, they said it was dishonest. It was actually competent. It was, you know, it's diligent. Like, I liked his response to that was competent, that was diligent. I don't like his, I think it was the state of New Mexico. Nobody cares, my man. Nobody cares at all. Oh, That's not an individual person with that power. She uh, uh, also sat there when Miss Zachary was on the stand, and Miss Zachary, I'll remind you, got an immunity agreement. Miss Zachary was promised she would never be prosecuted. And Miss Morrissey stands up and says, There's no evidence against Miss Zachary. Well, then why would she give him an immunity agreement? Why would she need immunity if there's nothing against Miss Zachary? Because she threw out bullets, you moron. Because she threw out the bullets and she could otherwise be prosecuted with that. Like, okay, okay. Um, why would she need immunity? Because of that. Um, do you have, like, did you did you get anything from, from Sarah Zachary to say that she committed some offense? She's got an immunity agreement. And then she's told on redirect examination by Ms. Morrissey, remember, if you don't tell the truth, I can prosecute you. I will prosecute you. So Miss Zachary doesn't tell the version of the truth that the government believes is true. We saw the threat in live court. Really? Is it the version of the truth that the government believes is true or just the truth? Because I don't think you can sell this at this point. You can't trust some of the witness testimony in this case. And that will raise a reasonable doubt as well, I submit, because of things like that because the lead investigator admits that she practiced her answers and questions with the prosecutor. Here's the th problem. It isn't raise a reasonable doubt. The defense has no obligation to raise a reasonable doubt. Um, the prosecution has to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. They have to prove, they have to eliminate all of the reasonable doubts that exist. Reasonable doubt is your starting point. You don't raise a reasonable doubt. You sit there and you do nothing. And there's reasonable doubt all over the place. So, um, you know, when he's saying we got to raise a reasonable doubt, never say that. Never say that because it suggests that you think the case is already proven. Now, I'm just going to note. 
Morrissey is a defense lawyer by trade. And look at her expression here. Look at her expression. She's like, really? Really? This is your argument? Um, yeah. This guy here who is on Hannah's side is like, oh, shit, he's botching it. That's something you can consider. Are you hearing everything? Although he's really itchy, so I don't know if he's paying that much attention. Or are you hearing a one-sided bird? And I think that's actually Thel in the background there, right at the back here with the white hair. That fits the narrative that Miss Gutierrez Reed has to be guilty because we picked her out first. It's got to be her. Can't be Mr. Kenny. Can't be anything else. Any other possibility. Sarah Zachary has nothing to do with it. Even though we know unquestionably she threw away rounds after uh, shooting. That's undoubtedly going to be evidence, but, but there's nothing on her, apparently. Gee, it would be helpful if your client hadn't told everyone that she loaded the gun. Second, these boxes. The idea that the boxes match. We heard testimony that these rounds were loaded in and out of these boxes daily. And I'm seeing some... All right, some further people saying that the testimony is quiet. Let us uh, fix that. Or I'll amp it up a little bit. There we go. There we go. Nobody knows what was in them on the 13th, the 16th, the 21st, because the rounds were put in, they were taken out, and they were put in different boxes. So the boxes really are, don't matter. There's there's reasonable doubt all over the place to the boxes because we don't know what was in them three or four days before. doesn't matter who brought them. Uh, the boxes are interesting because the government wants to match up the two and they want to show the pictures that match, yet all the... You see what he's not doing here? You see what he's not actually doing? He's not telling a story. He's not telling us what happened. He's not telling us anything. What he's doing instead is he's just like, here's a thing, and here's a thing, and here's a thing, and here's a thing, and here's another thing. And it's like, tell us how this all fits together, right? Um, you can't just shotgun it. You can't just be like, here's... 62 different ways to like no you gotta tell a story you gotta convince the jury not just like yeah ones from pdq props have the same label same font they're from joe swanson so those <laughs> um let's watch this at one time speed let's watch watch her face at all the Ones from PDQ Props have the same label, same font. They're from Joe Swanson. So those boxes are, are similar to the ones on set. So that that part. She is not a good poker player, I don't think. Because she just makes some stink face. That is stink face right there. Um, James C., I would love to go to Seattle at some point. I don't know when I will be in Seattle, but... Um... My God, that stink face was just like, oh, my God. It is, is not conclusive as well. The other part, when the government shows you video and video and video, and only on the 13th. And Thank said you, Shen Shen. And read was lax on safety. Well, again, you're seeing videos from short snippets of time on one day on an entire movie set. And then you're not seeing what Miss Gutierrez Reed may have done right after the clip. You're not seeing what might have happened right after that. The other thing that strongly rebuts all of the safety points Miss Morrissey is pointing out about Miss Gutierrez Reed is OSHA. Now they try to downplay OSHA, but OSHA is a separate independent state and federal agency that did a full investigation into the responsibility for safety failure. She's just right now writing down for reply. Um. On this set. And you can evaluate the credibility in your minds of, of Mr. Montoya who took the stand and how you thought he testified, whether you thought he was thorough and how he answered questions. He, he interviewed quite a few people. And he reviewed a lot of information. Their conclusion after that was done was that production was responsible. He said the root cause was production adopted a safety plan and it ended at the word adoption because they didn't do anything after that. They I don't really have closed captions that available. There safety concerns. They didn't allow for more. There are no closed captions available. Training and take the time to do that. They did not respond to the negligent discharges and deal with that. Mr. Halls talked to one of the guys briefly and that was all that happened. So you got to set the... They're not allowing a time for inventory for the armor. They're not allowing time for them to clean their weapons or deal with their weapons. This is management. Yes, sir. And the problem that he has is that 
the OSHA guy made it pretty clear that they were always going to find that it was management. Even if it's her fault, it's management's fault. So. Dupesh state that the first assistant director is the primary person for safety on that set. Dave Hall's been doing this 30 years. Somebody doing it 30 years has a responsibility and duty to step in when there's safety things going on. And he's on several of those videos. He has a responsibility to step in and say, hey, we're going to stop this. We're going to slow this down. We're going to have. So it's Dave Hall's fault for not stopping her. Have meetings. We're going to have additional safety training. We're going to address this. Ms. Gutierrez, we come over here. We're going to do this. And we're going to talk to people. She also can come in and talk about that. And on those. Yeah. Doubt to the boxes is stronger if she doesn't identify them, admit to using them and bring them on set in her interview. This is the problem. He's hitting all of the points that the prosecution has already knocked down. And he's basically just saying there's doubt about this. And it's just dropped as an assertion. It's just dropped as there is doubt on this. And he says, no, um, I see people saying, if you make it to Seattle, then you got to come to Portland. If I get to the point where I'm like, I can quit my day job and just do YouTube. What I might end up doing is something like buying a rail pass, um, through the U S and Canada. And, um, just going from town to town being like, I'm going to have a, uh, I'm going to have a meetup here and I'll just play, uh, play hobo for a bit, travel from place to place and uh, do meetups. That I think would be a lot of fun. I would love to do that, but yeah. Um, those looks were intentional because the court isn't going to nail her on it. Yeah. It might be. She's intentionally making stink eye for the, uh, for that. Videos. They're both on the videos. But OSHA found because of the lack of support, because she's a part-time armor, because she's not full-time, because she's not, there's not two of her, as Mr. Carpenter said, two is one and one is none. Well, here we didn't even have one. We had a half. It sucks so in Canada to too. Do just be fun. Things. She's a half a, a, a job on a set with over 20 guns. And they want to lay the complete blame on her in this case, as opposed to OSHA, who investigated as an official agency, and made an official determination that this was production and management. It was responsible. I see people saying that rail sucks in the U S and that I should instead do it with like a, uh, um, do it with like an RV. That would be a lot of driving, but maybe, um, I could see doing it. So maybe I'd have to rent an RV and do it. So that's important. That's an important finding because they said all of this was caused safety wise by management. As Mr. Sousa told you, the buck stops with production. The buck stops with production. As in any organization, it starts at the top. You don't go and take one of the lowest people on the call sheet after something bad that happens, after the whole management team is just... One of the lowest people on the call sheet. What? What's her job, though? Like, um, what... Does she have, like, some sort of specific job as the lowest person on the call sheet? Because I feel like that is a relevant consideration, right? Um, and like literally her job is armor, safety. The same thing as like, you know, if, if you're the head of craft services, you're way down on the call sheet. Like you are really, really, um, you're largely sort of irrelevant. Um but if the sandwiches suck, it's probably your fault, right? It's probably your fault. Your own safety aside, in favor of money, in favor of speed, in favor of profit, you throw all of that aside because at the end, you've got a convenient fall person. You've got a convenient scapegoat. And she may not be the armor on some days. She's a props person, but she's certainly the armor when everything goes bad. You know why? Because despite OSHA's uh, findings that they were responsible for production, the guys that you saw come in, the producers, the big guys, they want to sail off into the sunset and go on about their business, finish the movie, make the money, because they've got the convenient fall person sitting right here. And all that has to happen is everybody has to gang up. Everybody has to... Yes, the convenient fall person who was the fault, like whose job it was to be safety on you know, for the firearms, right? Like, oh my God. Have their talks after this happened and blame Hannah. So it has to happen. That's what happened in this case. You had a production company on a shoestring budget, an A-list actor that was really running the show. He was directing people in those clips, telling the camera person where to go, telling the armor where to go. 
And then you had a situation where at the end they had somebody they could all blame. It didn't work out with OSHA because OSHA didn't buy it. OSHA said it was the higher ups. <laughs> so here we are in a criminal court where the government tries to pin all of it on Ms. Gutierrez Reed. And it's just not the truth. It's absolutely right. We do want the truth. We want the truth and all the facts that were found by OSHA to be considered. We wanted all of the facts that you don't have in this courtroom to be considered because that's the only fair way to do it, to resolve all reasonable doubt and to rule it out. If you don't have all the evidence, you can't rule out all of that reasonable doubt. I want to talk about foreseeability and I want to play this for you. 10 days out of a 12 day shoot is full time. Yeah. <coughs> <clears throat> Everyone else is hearing sound, so I'm not sure what's going on on your end, Lynn. Uh, but uh... that was the scene where Mr. Baldwin runs up the hill, and Cut is yelled, and right after Cut is yelled, he shoots. Gee, whose job would it have been to take issue with that? And might that, like, because later the question is, how could she have known that Baldwin would have? Um, how could she have possibly known that Baldwin might have been? a bit of a loose cannon with a gun. Well, because he already has been. You're scoring, sir, on the wrong net. You're hitting the wrong net here, sir. Like, um, you're putting points on the board, but it's for the other team. That's, I submit, reasonable doubt, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Because Mr. Baldwin went off script. He chose to fire after cut was called. And you're going to see where he does later do the same thing in this tragic shooting. Mamie Mitchell told you on the stand, the script supervisor, that it was not in the script for Mr. Baldwin to point the weapon. It was not in the script for him to point the weapon. Quite possibly. And we have to be very careful with facts when we're considering a, cr a criminal case and the beyond the reasonable doubt standard. That's extremely important because Ms. Gutierrez Reed, nor anybody else, knew that Mr. Baldwin in that moment was going to point the weapon right at Helena and Mr. Hutchins and Mr. Souza and do what he did. How could she have known that Baldwin could be a risk? You just showed us. You are contradicting yourself within like a sentence, man. Um... That is the concept of foreseeability. Now, Ms. Morrissey gave you an example of if I hand somebody a, a firearm and it's loaded and then they go and do something with it, uh, and it hurt somebody. But here, what we had, we she did not know Mr. Baldwin was going to do what he did. No one, first of all, called her back into the church that he was using the gun at that time. She had given it to Halls to sit in in the church. Mr. Halls then gave it to Mr. Baldwin, and that is the conclusion of the lead investigator. That was what Baldwin said, and that is what Ms. Gutierrez Reed said. So Halls hands it to him. No one calls her back in to let her know Baldwin is doing that blocking scene. She doesn't know that's happening. The medic said she did not hear anybody call that out, first team, over the channel. So that's not getting put out. So Baldwin's doing an, another audible like he did on this video that you just saw. He's going off script. That defeats any idea that that was foreseeable to Miss Gutierrez Reed. If she doesn't know. Man, with a gun loaded with dummies, he should have been able to go off script and fire it six times into his dome and been fine. Like that was what she, that was what was promised. Right. And he's saying like, it's Seth Kenny, it's Sarah Zachary, it's Baldwin. It's everyone except the person who loaded the gun. Like when he's pointing the fingers at everybody, he needs to have a consistent story about how her care, her careful behavior was defeated. And he doesn't have that at all here. He's just got, and look at all these other it's everyone else's fault what's happening she can't foresee it that's a big part of the, the instruction the other part i want to talk about foreseeability and where this matters is live rounds now live rounds in this type of situation has not happened in hollywood in the hundred years of hollywood this has not happened in a situation like we saw in this case my client is a legendary screw up such that nobody has screwed up like her in a hundred years, a hundred years of whatever. And she is the first person to be this much of a screw up. 
that ain't a win. That that ain't a win. <laughs> like a one on that set foresaw, knew, or thought that live rounds were going to be on that set. No one. You did not hear one witness in this case. Uh, even Miss Morrissey said there was no evidence that Hannah knew about live rounds coming on. Or this this was. But it was literally her job to check, right? It is her job to check and to make sure, verify every single time. Done. There's no evidence of that. Nobody thought live rounds were going to be on set. Mr. Souza um, told the doctors he couldn't believe it. He argued with them because it was inconceivable that live rounds would appear. Because of that, when you read the jury instructions, there's a concept in the involuntary manslaughter of an element of willful disregard of the rights of another. That word willful, I'm going to go over it soon, means purposeful. That you willfully do something, you purposely do something. What's impossible for the government to prove in this case... We're going to see an objection. Yep, there it is. What is the objection? Because he's mischaracterizing willfulness. That's what the objection is. He's trying to see, make willfulness be that she intended to cause, you know, a death. And that's not the definition. So that's where the objection is. I think she loses the objection, but I think she loses it because the judge says you can clear that up on, on your, you know, reclose on your reply. So uh, don't shoot people. Uncomplicated legal advice. Lol. Yes. Uh, I'm thinking Hannah's non-emotional attitude is not helping this Ladies evening. And I'm going to talk Love about your stream. Thank you. more in a moment when we get there. But it cannot be willful if Hannah does not know there's live rounds. And nobody did. So she did not do something um, willfully. RN number 10 is my favorite whiskey. Baldwin could foreseeably hurt somebody with this firearm. Because she didn't know it was live. And let me give you an example. Um, it's akin to uh, a nurse, let's say in a hospital, who the pharmacy mislabels uh, a drug. And let's say it comes to her and, and somebody's ordered it be administered to a patient. She then administers it, not knowing that it's a fatal drug of some other type. The pharmacy's mislabeled it. The patient passes. It's the the thing is, is this analogy is no good because if the pharmacy has mislabeled it, then there's no way to tell. But let's say instead her job, her task, is to make sure that the label says, you know, whatever, like you know, not gonna kill you. And she instead gets a pill bottle that says cyanide. And instead of reading the label to see like, oh, is this cyanide? I should not give that to a patient. She's just like, ah, reading the labels is too much of a hassle. It, it's probably not cyanide. It never, it's never cyanide. So off it goes. The nurse here isn't Hannah. Hannah is not the nurse. Dave Halls is the nurse, and he still pled guilty. Um, and, like, Dave Halls should have checked better, too. Same situation as we have here, where the government would be saying the nurse committed involuntary manslaughter. No, that's not true, because she did not know what happened. Your analogy is bad, ago, sir. Um, when the Tylenol capsules were laced with the cyanide, way back in the 80s or somewhere around there, the, there was no prosecution of the pharmacies that didn't know about this, that were tainted by it. It's the same type of situation yeah. we have here with the nurse. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed did not know there were live rounds, and she was entitled to rely on production buying dummies and the boxes labeled dummies. She's entitled to rely. Then what the is her job? Like, we've heard that her job is to check, but if she's entitled to rely on production buying dummies, then she doesn't have to check. Like, his argument right now is that it doesn't matter if she checks. She can just throw whatever the hell in the gun because she's been told that they're probably dummies. That That's not her job. The armorer con contradicted this. Tons of witnesses contradicted this. Your own witness contradicted this. Oh, my God. And that reliance is reasonable. So she cannot foresee a live round. It's not reasonable. Uh, it was literally her job to not rely on that. You saw her first statement. She didn't have a, an attorney. Like, it was literally her job to not rely on that. We've heard that from a number of witnesses. She did waive her rights and answer her question. She had not been advised at that time Ms. Hutchins had passed. And she came in a second time and answered all questions. The reason why I say that is she was cooperative. She was trying to assist in what this investigation, uh, what they were investigating. No, she was stupid and she had a bad lawyer. Uh, 
That's why she gave those two statements. Dumb, bad lawyer. A Corporal Hancock. Corporal Hancock never fully investigated the source of the live rounds. And she told you that she focused on people on the set. So again, in ruling out reasonable doubt and where those live rounds came from, we have not done that in this case because there was never a full investigation as to the source of the live rounds. Let me give you an example. The state never called Joe Swanson. And it's kind of remarkable because Joe Swanson was the original source of where these came from. And the job of the armor is not to trust Joe Swanson. It's to check Joe Swanson's work. So what does it matter? Like, and here's the thing. Um, you can call Joe Swanson. You could bring Joe Swanson in to be like, hey, I I didn't like, I, you know what? I just send out live ammo all the time. You could have called him. Where's Joe Swanson, defense? Make him happen. He's also the JS in all the boxes. So the idea that the person where it originated, you wouldn't call that person and get some more information is is interesting but more than it's interesting who else didn't call joe swanson um did any of the witnesses say that it was likely to be joe swanson and that it leaves a huge hole in the origin of the live rounds let me tell you what else it did seth kenny's fingerprints and dna were never taken seth kenny talked to corporal hancock 40 times or more we already knew that his fingerprints were there and there wasn't any DNA evidence that was of interest here. So what does it matter? You're chasing shadows here. They supplied information back and forth and he starts making you wonder about what's going on and why I'm, I'm called dishonest for raising the possibility that maybe Mr. Kenny was the source because he's pretty tight with law enforcement in this case, obviously. They don't do a prop search warrant until six days after the incident. Oh, I mean, and that was Corporal Hancock and the rest of the sheriffs. Nobody on the set was going to speak up for her. Nobody. And yeah. Um, editor Danielle Marie, thanks for outstanding coverage. So appreciated. Nobody on that set was going to speak up for her because nobody on that set will take her phone calls going forward. Like I can tell you uh, when she's in custody, um, they're not putting money on her commissary, right? They're not putting money. Um, uh, on her accounts she's they're not going to be visiting her dad will visit her um they don't search mr yeah. kenny's business until over a month after they never asked the fbi to check live rounds for fingerprints or dna and so we will not know if mr kenny's by the way watch the pictures he pulls up because like corporal uh hancock and there she is looking like you know Mrr. corporal hancock looks like Mrr fingerprints or anybody else's would have ever appeared on those live rounds on set because they didn't get that evidence. Bryce Ziegler, I want to tell you a little bit, remind you a little bit about his testimony, and that's Mr. Ziegler. Um, he talked about Baldwin's revolver being single single action. You have to cock it, and then uh, every time you want to shoot it, he testified about breaking that firearm. They actually So he likes Ziegler. Um, after testing that was approved by the sheriff by hitting that with a hammer. He talked about that you can't determine a live round from a picture, and that's the other point. I think is important to consider when considering the picture analysis. Now, the Latin print examiner, the uh, examined... Is that a flattering picture of the lab print examiner? Various things, but she did not examine anything uh, Seth Kenny-wise. There's no analysis on the cartridges from a prop cart and found eight FBI employee prints. Mr. Gillette on the, now, we the powder testing only tested 11 rounds from Seth Kenny. Again, we know that he brought back 125. <laughs> from the group that went to 1883. And I also want to remind you about 1883, some of those were Starline brass rounds. And some of those he said had silver primers. So when we get to the set, the live rounds are Starline brass and they have silver primers. It's a continuous chain that could have been traced from Bell Reed all the way to Seth Kenny all the way back to the set. But they did not do that thorough investigation and that's reasonable doubt they have not ruled out. What's reasonable doubt? You're saying it's a continuous chain what is the actual doubt here? What is the actual, like, what is the argument that they failed to rule out that actually helps your client other than just they could have investigated some more shit and they didn't. And maybe, like, you don't get to reasonable doubt on the possibility that maybe there's something, like, you just... Mm. The dummies, again, I submit... This is another area of reasonable doubt. 
Witnesses testified this set contained a dangerous mix of dummies. They were dangerous because it was impossible for the armor and prop master to hear and rattle all of the dummies, uh, especially under pressure, rushing noise on the set. You saw there was. And here's the thing. If you can't tell that it's a dummy, like if I have a dummy and somehow it jams up and I can't tell that it's a dummy, I don't put it in a gun because you should only put something in a gun if you are actually able to confirm that it is safe. Like, if this thing stops rattling and if it had an actual primer, I would not put this in a gun. Like, on a film set. Sorry. A lot of wind that day on the lapel. There's people running around. There's, I think at one point somebody said 200 people. There's all kinds of things going on. Um, and despite that, Mr. Haig uh, indicated in a quiet office he could not hear one of the dummies when it's rattled. That's dangerous because when you're trying to do it quickly, when there's a lot of noise, it may be a dummy. Um, it may not. You can't hear it rattle. Except if you're, this is dangerous because if you're careless, you might cause somebody to die. Oh. Kenny, again, mentioned in this case that he always rattle tested his rounds and he made sure they're dummies. He told you all that. Well, the problem, but even the box that they say was Seth Kenny's and the rounds that came out of it, there was one round, if you remember, that was gunked and it didn't shake. That round had to be sent to the FBI to be broken apart and to be checked to see if it was live. So if he truly is that thorough and shaking, he missed that round. Okay, cool. Should he would he have loaded that into a gun? That's the question. Producers, they had oversight over the budget team. They didn't know where the funds were set aside for the the producers. Look at the picture they got of the guy on the bottom. Oh, I'm saying look at the picture of the guy they got on the bottom, and you can't see him at all. There we go. Look at the, look at this guy's picture. <laughs> you should have blamed the brass manufacturer, might as well with the number of other people he's blaming. Yeah. Look at the picture of the guy at the bottom. Like, <laughs> I I can tell you that's not the best picture that they could get of this guy. So, yeah. Armor. They were on location for filming and they were fined the statutory maximum by OSHA for managerial safety violations. Again, OSHA found that the management team are the ones responsible. And yet we're here with Ms. Gutierrez Reed, the person on trial for the felony offenses. Sherilyn Shea really, you you want to blame the producers who had who didn't touch the ammo? Schaefer was the medic on set. You recall she did not have chess seals. Um, she, I think, was doing the best she could with the equipment that she had, but she didn't have the um, complete equipment to deal with a gunshot wound. She also indicated she never heard anyone call out use of a gun before the fatal shooting. Mamie Mitchell, I touched on this earlier. Most important thing Ms. Mitchell said was that it was not in the script for Baldwin to point the firearm. Gee, it, it would be a real bad thing if Baldwin, who can't be trusted with a gun, is, you know, given a gun that is loaded with live ammo. That goes directly to the element when you read the jury instructions and you all go back in to deliberate. Uh, that goes to foreseeability. And whether or not anybody can foresee the moments Mr. Baldwin pointing the gun, using it as a, a pointer, he's up on the hill shooting after cut, and then he's shooting. This is an excellent question. Um... Ian, can you physically feel through your fingers if a dummy can rattle? Yes. Um, I am going to step aside for just a moment. I'm going to be right back. I'll be right back.
I'm sorry about that. I had to go get something. And um, I also need to look up YouTube policies to make sure I don't get myself in some trouble. Because we are going to, um, if I can, I'm going to do a demo. All right. So we're going to move on here. Uh, pointing the gun when he's not supposed to in scenes. David Halls. Um, David Halls was the first assistant director, as you remember, and he was in charge of overall safety. Now, he got a misdemeanor, six months unsupervised probation, even though he was in charge of overall set safety. He never raised any concerns. And in fact, I think he said Hannah did a great job as armor. He that was he not, not what he said. Baldwin, but the sheriff contradicted this. So did Hannah and so did Mr. Baldwin. Uh, and that was essentially Mr. Halls. Testing. He said she did a great or that she didn't like she did a great job that day. Right. Um, that is not the same thing as saying that she did a great job. It's that she did a... Uh... So, yeah. Okay, so I was looking at the YouTube policies. The YouTube policies say I can't handle a firearm on a live stream. So, what did I do? Um, I got some 45 long cold. Um... Actual 45 long cold. You hear the shake, you don't hear the shake. Cool. I got five of them. We're going to play a little game here. I am going to take these five and I'm going to put them in a little container, this glasses case. I am going to take five dummies. And I am going to make the worst film scenario ever because I now have five dummies on this, right? Five dummies. So, and I'm going to mix them up. I now have a bunch of cartridges loose together. And I got something else. I got my ear pro. I can't hear anything. And... I'm going to turn on some background music so I can hear even less. We got background music. I can't hear anything except that. Now, I am going to close my eyes. Dummy. And I, I need a place to put them where they're not. What do I have here? What do I, have? I don't want to put the lead in that. Eh, do I have a container? I'm just going to throw them in my drawer. All right. So, uh, I need two different drawers, though. Two different drawers. There we go. I'm going to open them staggered. So, I'm going to pick them up, eyes closed, and just, you know, we're going to do this. So, eyes closed. Dummy. Dummies go in the top drawer. Dummy. Dummy. Live. 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 Dummy. Dummy. Okay, we've just separated them all out. How'd I do is going to be the question. How'd we do here? So I got rounds in each of them. And now I'm going to check my lives. One, two, three, four. Um, I thought I had five. Looks like I had four. All right. Or I screwed up. And now I'm going to check my dummies. Each of these dummies should have... Yeah, so... Dummy. 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 And that was with four rounds instead of five. Um, so... Oh, wait. No, I had five. One just rolled. Also, one of the lives was alive. I successfully... Um, with my eyes closed and no ability to hear anything, could tell the dummies from the lives. 
And none of those would go into a gun because if you can't tell, you can't tell. But you can feel the BB in your hand as you shake it. Um, the fifth was the, the lives were all with the lives. The dummies were all with the dummies. Everything was successfully sorted of those 10. So even if it was like a jet engine going off, I didn't lose track of it. I put it into a drawer and then it rolled within the drawer. It went into the correct drawer. It got into the sec into the correct place. So that's all that happened. It just rolled back. Even with my eyes closed and the, uh, you know, and my ears blocked so I couldn't hear anything, just by feel, I could feel the dummies from the lives because of, you know, because of the BB there. So this this whole argument about the noise yeah and and let's say one of those dummies for some reason I couldn't tell the difference between it if I can't tell the difference I don't put it in the gun mm. so yeah this whole argument about it being noisy now this wasn't in evidence nobody called this but yeah um Good point. That proves nothing, Runkle. You're not high on coke. Um, I, I, I have some Coca Cola. Does that help? <laughs> Sarah Zachary, I remind you, she threw away rounds on set after the shooting. Took items off the prop cart. Wait. What? What the fuck? Okay, we're two hours in. What the fuck is this? in the the bottom right what the fuck is that um <laughs> emily are you still here have you ever seen any fuckery like this <laughs> have you ever seen anything like that um like oh my god I would have objected to that emoji. I mean, I know it's the emoji that was sent, but like, oh, that's um, that's some effery. Uh, I don't think I don't think we see an objection here, and I think it's probably because the prosecution is just like, it doesn't matter. She worked for Seth Kenny, and she texted and called him right after the shooting. She one of her texts she indicated she had said she was talking to Alec Baldwin and trying to keep her facts straight. She mentioned that she had loaded firearms on set. She picked up ammunition from Kenny at PDQ. I'll remind you in the testimony that Sarah Zachary and Hannah Gutierrez Reed went to Kenny's place before production started, and he had given them ammunition, leathers, and firearms. So again, we don't know exactly what Mr. Kenny may have supplied to the set because it's not inventory. It's not all that invoiced. Who? Whose job would it have been to detect a live round amongst those? I'll also remind you about Sarah Zachary when you're considering her credibility and her testimony. She had the text where she wanted Hannah to go to jail. And she's given complete immunity. She had the text where she wanted Hannah to go to jail. You know who else wants Hannah to go to jail? The jury. <laughs> the jury wants Hannah to go to jail. This is a really weak argument about, like, she wants Hannah to go to jail. Because the only way the jury is going to find that persuasive is if they already agree that she shouldn't go to jail. But if they are already thinking that that she should go to jail, that Hannah deserves jail, then the jury is going to be like, of course she wants Hannah to go to jail. That is where Hannah belongs. Get her her toothbrush and her stripy jacket. Like... <laughs> Seth Kenny, again, I, I mentioned this, he supplied the letters, guns, and ammo before arrest began. He had no inventory system. And I we attached some pictures to the right that you can look at in the jury room about his place. Was <laughs> Look at the picture they chose for Seth Kenny. <laughs> Look at the image. I mean, seriously? Absolute mess. There was stored live, live ammo in the bathroom. And one of the things I think was important to remind you of is he actually called Joe Swanson and had a conversation with him. And after he gets off the call, his first words are shit, shit, shit. And so that's something as an investigator, you would think after he does that, maybe I should call Joe Swanson and see what's happening. See what that means. 
that hmm. did you ever ask Joe Swanson what that means? You could have called him. Reasonable doubt has not been ruled out. I went over this uh, on the 1883 set, and he brought 125 uh, rounds back. Mr. Carpenter, I want to remind you, he was a state's expert armor. One of the most important points he said was two is one and one is nine. And here we didn't have uh, a properly staffed armor uh, component to the set. What he said was basically you've got to check and recheck. This is not the goal. You, This is not the win you think it is, sir. Like he's trying to spin Mr. Carpenter as if it's, and what he ends up looking is he's cherry picking things that people said. It's like, that is not, he's not on your side, dude. Luke Haig, he said the live rounds on set were reloads. Um, he could not hear the dummy rattle in the quiet office. And he said, Mr. Bowen violated basic safety rules. Karen Kuhn, you may remember, was the. He said he could not hear the dummy rattle in a quiet office. Why couldn't Luke Haig hear the dummy rattle in a quiet office? Is it because the dummy is real hard to rattle? Or is it something particular to Mr. Haig? Um, something about Mr. Haig. Uh, was it that his ears suck? Like, the jury is sitting here going, he couldn't hear the dummy rattle because he has hearing damage. Not because these things are indistinguishable. It's because Mr. Haig is disabled, sir. <laughs> He said, Mr. Bowen violated basic safety rules. Oh, Karen Kuhn, you may remember, was the photographer. She said the armor was checking guns before when she was present. And she also made a comment about Mr. Baldwin that on the day she was taking questions, I believe she said on the 21st, he told her to get out of his personal space and said something in a, in a manner that kind of goes along with how he was on the set. Um, this is the best you've got as Baldwin said, get out of my personal space. Mr. Souza was kind about it. He said he had a strong personality, but you can see it in the videos and you can see how Mr. Baldwin was acting. Rebecca Smith, I want to. Mr. Uh, Mr. Souza was kind about it. He said he has a strong personality. Gee, could you have perhaps cross-examined on that point and established that it was more than that if you'd asked questions with that? He keeps going on and on and on about this. We'll about the he lands... She said that, that she yeah. hadn't used cocaine in 31 years. She saw a baggie inside a baggie for approximately five seconds. She didn't know if it was cocaine or meth or something else. But she admitted at the end she was guessing. And we also know that the substance in the baggie was never tested. And so there, the only evidence you have of narcotics in this case is a guess. Now, Mr. And you said it could be meth or creatine. Okay. Morrissey in her closing indicated that, well, of course we don't have the evidence. The whole thing is throwing it away. Well, you have to prove first that it was evidence. So in a normal tampering case, when let's say a firearm is thrown away and we know a firearm was used and somebody throws a firearm away, we know that was a firearm. So we know that would be evidence in a case involving a shooting. Here. I don't think firearm is the example you want to use on this particular case because firearm might be excellent in any normal case, except that this is a case where we've heard dozens and dozens of examples of fake guns, right? How do you know it's not that Denix replica that Custer was pointing everywhere? How do you know it's not a rubber gun? How do you know it's like... This is the problem you've got is that it looks like cocaine and sure it could be replica cocaine or, you know, a rubber cocaine, but like wrong example, sir. We have an unknown substance. Again, they have to rule out all of the reasonable doubt by that. It's not enough to say it's probably something under a criminal standard. It's probably cocaine in that bag because Miss Smith says it is. If it even happened, we don't even know this happened. Government hasn't established that except through her testimony. We don't know if there was a bag. We don't know if this actually was passed. And that's. Did you actually suggest to her that she lied to it? Because lied about it? Because now you're saying her credibility is garbage. Um, I can tell you that here in Canada, if I made this argument, what the what would be following this is a jury instruction basically telling the jury that I am full of shit. Um, because if you want to argue that this never happened, that we shouldn't believe her, I have to actually on cross-examination say, this is just a lie, right? And he, he didn't do that. Um, at least I didn't. Bird. It, let's say it did happen, that you, you believe it did happen. It's not enough to say what was probably in that bag. They have the burden to rule it out beyond a reasonable doubt that it couldn't have been anything else. So you're telling us it's probably cocaine. 
<laughs> and she's already calling it in her testimony, potentially multiple substances, cocaine, methamphetamine, or possibly something else. So she's not even certain about what it is. Without a, a, a test, without something presumptive to tell you on a test, there's no way of telling what was in that bag. And it's not enough in a criminal case. OSHA, we talked about in detail. and Now he wins on that point, but yeah. Um, my name is Inspector Montoya. <laughs> prepare to be searched or <laughs> prepare to be audited. I just want to remind you the root cause they found, they attributed all the responsibility for safety issues to management. Mr. Elliott, uh, he was defense expert investigator, got an extensive law enforcement experience, if you recall, an AP. I can tell you, I would have left Mr. Elliott out of my slideshow. Um, I would have left him out of my case, but I, I would not be like rocking this guy in the slideshow. Like, oh yeah, this guy who completely got curb stopped on cross examination. PD and military. One of his big points was Mr. Baldwin was not segregated at the beginning, even though he was the known shooter. Hannah was segregated right away. Again, they zeroed in on her uh, in the, the rush to have her identified. And he already admitted that none of this mattered and that there was no reason to pursue Seth Kenny. Great. He indicated there was 20 or so key witnesses not identified and segregated. And the problem with that is they can get their stories together and they can uh, change their stories. They can have their memories altered. We know this happened in this case because after the incident, Mr. Baldwin is talking to Sarah Zachary. Uh, she's, he's texting and talking to her. Seth Kenny is talking to Sarah Zachary. Mr. Halls is talking to Baldwin after. And so we don't have all the information they're talking about, but we do know they're coordinating, they're talking. The only one not in that group uh, was, was Hannah. And again, this was the idea. We've got to circle the wagons and we've got to pick out the person that's going to take the fall for everything that's happened here. That's so are you saying that the police were part of this, that the police were conspiring against Hannah? Hannah. That's who they got. Okay. Law enforcement failed to follow up on the origin of the live rounds and their delayed search warrants caused problems with missing evidence. PJ Pesh testified just this morning. Huh? Did they miss somebody? Um, they missed somebody. They went from Scott Elliott. Um, yeah, we got Scott Elliott. We got we got the OSHA guys. Scott Elliott. You know, more Scott Elliott. And then PJ Pesh. I, I think you might have missed somebody, sir. Is there the a reason for that? Has problems with missing evidence. PJ Pesh testified just this morning. Um, he had said, like everybody else, he's never... <laughs> when your expert doesn't make the, the cut... It's like, that said, what were they going to do? They were going to pick the picture of him pointing the gun at the judge? That would have been the ideal. <laughs> Seen in 35 years in armor split duties with props. It was not possible for one person to keep track of so many firearms. And he indicated it's important to give the armor adequate time and resources, which OSHA said as well. She was not given that to do her job. And then he said, oh, right, he had three hours. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I guess that's a different thing. I want to talk to you about the law that the judge instructed you on, and, and that is the law. What the judge uh, told you about is what has to be, we have to follow in terms of evaluating this. The law presumes the defendant to be innocent. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense, the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act in the graver and more important affairs of life, a doubt based on reason and common sense. So what the government has to do is rule out every reasonable doubt you may have based on reason and common sense, or in this country, we don't convict people that's the standard and again i go back to where i started at the beginning and this i like like this is important but yeah if they didn't rule out the reasonable doubt on miss zachary throwing away the rounds that is always going to be there because their theory how what is what could she have thrown out that would have helped your client here what would that have been based on you can identify these pictures and we know exactly what was on the set and what remained on the set and what we will never know that because some of them were thrown away what could it have been? I didn't get all of Seth Kenny's rounds. We're never going to know that. Tell us what it could have been. Tell us what would have saved your client. Tell us, sir. How well, do we get, reasonable doubt. you know. I've gone over the top two, top three. The prop cart was tampered with. Uh, we know that. Because let's consider our extremes here. Um, extreme one, she throws out all dummies, right? How does that help Hannah if all of those guns were loaded with dummies? Well, it doesn't. Extreme two. Those other guns were loaded straight lives. 
that also doesn't help Hannah here. So there is nothing that could have been in those guns that actually helps Hannah in the slightest. And I don't get it. After the incident, another individual moved it. Now, Lieutenant Benavides said he had eyes on uh, the entire time. But if you saw that video, you can make up your mind what you believe. Um, ladies and gentlemen, his camera appeared to be pointed right into the vehicle. And the individual getting the cart was way off in the other direction. Ladies and gentlemen, his and you see some of these um, things on the reasonable doubt. Um, I... Do I have a way to remove me? Yes. Okay. I'm I'm still here, folks. I'm just hiding. So um, some of the things on this uh, esophageal intubation was ineffective to provide oxygen to Elena. That's not reasonable doubt. Um, wasn't adequate medical care on set. That's also not reasonable doubt. Like a lot of these things are just he wants to put stuff up on his board, but it's not relevant. The camera appeared to be pointed right into the vehicle, and the individual getting the cart was way off in the other direction. He said he had his head turned, but you all can decide uh, what you think about that. The prop cart, there was unquestionably items taken from. Now, if you wonder why this clothes sucks so bad, it's because he has nothing to... Um, it's because he's got nothing to work with. He's just like, something here's got to stick, something's got to land, so everything, right? Um we don't know exactly what those are. That is another area of reasonable doubt that the government has not ruled out. Yeah, why are we talking about everything else except anything that makes your client not an integral link in the chain that led to this discharge? Interrupt the chain, but he can't. That's the problem. He can say like, oh, there's other people are sketch, but he can't actually say, he can't give a story of how his, Hannah's not at fault. You've had witnesses say throughout the trial, you can't tell live ammo from a picture. And the reason is that the FBI said it has to be disassembled and you have to open it up because there's powder in it. If there's not powder in it, then it's not live. You can't tell it from a picture. You have to shake it. OSHA stated the root cause of all safety failures was management. OMI ruled this to be an accident, not a homicide. You heard evidence about the esophageal intubation was ineffective to provide oxygen to Helena. Doesn't matter. This also was a situation in this case where multiple lawsuits have been filed, and you can evaluate their testimony, those people who have filed lawsuits, with care and caution, because they've got an interest, potentially, in what's happening in this case by being involved in lawsuits. Like your guy who admitted that he was paid and that his job was to help the defense? Involuntary manslaughter, uh, you're going to have that instruction when you go back. That is the um, charge that, the, that Her Honor has read to you. She's given you the law on this. I want to focus you on a couple key points. The government has the burden to show each of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the elements are the numbered items. What that means is, if you all have reasonable doubts on any of these elements... Have... Okay, let's just talk about... And I'm going to hide again, just so you can see this. Let's just talk about how you are going to write your PowerPoints. Um, you have to be... It has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements. Right now, the defense is standing there with a PowerPoint that says things like, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed's act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. Do you think maybe you could have written this in a way that doesn't sound like you're confessing on behalf of your client here? Do you think maybe you could have written this in a way that says, like, you know, <laughs> like... Yeah, I mean... <sighs> It literally says up there, you know, Hannah Gutierrez Reed acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others. You want to phrase it like that on your PowerPoint? Um, no, you do not. Do not. You know, um, I cannot be convicted. And I want to focus you in on element three that Hannah acted with a willful disregard. Again, you go back to. Yes, that's the exact text from the instructions they got. Um, I would, I would paraphrase, right? Um, the The prosecution must establish knowledge of the danger involved by her actions in negligently handling or using a firearm. You take your client's name out of it, like you, <laughs> if you know. Hmm. Willful disregard, the nurse example, and the idea that if somebody doesn't know. I mean, that could be the same thing with a nurse on trial for involuntary manslaughter. But if she doesn't know the drug was mislabeled. These are the jury instructions. I would not put this there. 
or something like that. It's the same thing in this case because no one knew there were live rounds. So she did not act willfully in anything that happened that day. In loading the, the firearm, this was a nor another day everybody thought on set. Loading the firearms, running to different things, doing the duties. Nobody's calling her back in for the blocking Yeah, scene. you know who she thought it was another day? Elena Hutchins. Nobody in the wildest dreams thought there was a live round. And because of that... You know why they didn't think there was a live round? Because they trusted Hannah. The next element is that Hannah Gutierrez read that caused it, right? <laughs> I submit to you that what caused uh, her to pass was Mr. Baldwin going off script and pointing the weapon. Mr. Now, Bolton, Harry, Hale, Hale, Harry the there. armor in that video had dyed hair by Clyde's brown hair. Again, Prosecutor didn't investigate hair at all. That's nobody knew doubt. there was ever going to be a live round on that set. But the only the only ultimate act is, is the pointing of that weapon. I'm halfway expecting him to start in with, if Chewbacca doesn't, <laughs> you know, if Chewbacca lives on it, you know, is a Wookiee who lives on whatever. Yeah. Miss Gutierrez wasn't in the church. She didn't point that weapon. She didn't pull it. Nobody called her back in. And because of that, those two elements, I submit to you, have not been proven on involuntary manslaughter. And they have to be. The government has to resolve all your reasonable doubts about that, or they don't, you cannot, uh, we cannot convict. Mental state and willful disregard. Uh, and that is going to be in your, in your instructions. For you to find the defendant acted negligently in this case, you must find that the, the defendant acted with willful disregard. And, and so, again, that's the terminology, is willful disregard. You're also going to be instructed, the court instructed you, Her Honor, on negligent use of a firearm. And that is a, a lesser included offense of the involuntary manslaughter. Uh, so when you go back and deliberate, you will have uh, this in front of you as well, whether Ms. Gutierrez Reed endangered the safety of another by handling or using a firearm in a negligent manner. And again, the language is acted with willful disregard. That's what has to be proven under that charge <clears throat> for her, for you to resolve all of your reasonable doubts. I got to say, at this stage, I might have decided to run a defense purely on the argument that she shouldn't be convicted of the greater charge, but she should be convicted on the lesser charge. That I think he might have done a lot better on just to say, like, don't convict on the negligent homicide, convict on the negligent use of a firearm. He might have been able to pull that off. And then Hannah ends up with a misdemeanor instead of the felony. And she gets to own guns again one day. Tampering with evidence, I think this is a real stretch, and it's a, it is a real stretch. And, and you talk about guessing. This one, they have to prove the defendant hit a bag of cocaine. Oh, absolutely. Well, the only witness they have to it said it was either cocaine. He's or risking a jury instruction, else. like a jury so clarification. Just, just by the testimony alone, the beginning of that, you can't. There's no way of knowing it was a bag of cocaine. It's just impossible. I think he's likable. I just think he's by the government's own witness. Bad at their only witness. Lawyer, no law enforcement testing. There's nobody else. This, this is absolutely unproven in this case. You don't even have to get to element two because element one is not even close to having, having been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Proximate cause, it's a legal term, but it's something the government has to prove as well. And this is where you get into that the passing was a foreseeable result of Hannah Gutierrez's act. The act was a significant cause of the death and the language I want to focus you in on in a natural and continuous chain of events uninterrupted by an outside event. What these mean... Like the defense lawyer is likable. I think I would enjoy having a beer with him. Um... I don't think that'll happen unless he doesn't know who I am, but you know, yeah. And legal, these are the legal terminology. What it means is that what Hannah Gutierrez did had to be a foreseeable result, but again, that caused her death. But again, without her knowing that there was a live round, that's impossible to meet that standard. But everyone has said it's her job to check the rounds. So if she isn't checking the rounds, then whose fault is that? You know, space aliens? Um, the man in the moon, lizard people, like who was supposed to do that? She did not have that knowledge. And there's no witness that came in. She didn't have that knowledge because she didn't check. She had that knowledge. Without it, nothing she did. She has that willful disregard because she just doesn't know. Now, she doesn't know because she didn't check well? because was that was her event. job. Was two outside events. Whoever put the live round on set and then Mr. Baldwin in the end going off script and doing what he did. Those are outside events outside of Miss Gutierrez Reed's control. That she didn't know was going to happen. That breaks any idea, uh, and there's reasonable doubt that she had anything to do ultimately with Helena Hutchins' death. Ms. Gutierrez Reed was not a significant cause as a result of her death because of the reasons I've mentioned to you. Another instruction her, her Honor gave you is that negligence. Really, she was not a significant cause. You, we have the evidence that she loaded the gun with the fatal round and that it was her job 
You know who tells us it was her job to check every round? Who, whose job it was? Her job. It was her job. Miku's headphones. I quoted you in my final exam, LMAO. Um, send me an email. I really want to. Uh, I I want to hear that one. Um, he also blows past the substantial contributing factor. Uh, issue with proximate cause. Again, he didn't have anything to work with because of mistakes he made during this investigation cell interview. Yeah. Um, Person, he, he again, was... I'm going to highlight the language. If he blew his case before he got events, in the room. But he again, continued to blow it once he got there. On that set, is you have dummy rounds, you have blank rounds, and then you have um, an orderly progression with how those are being used. Here, we had a completely unforeseeable live round, uh, six live rounds, the round set nobody could perceive. And then we have Mr. Baldwin's action in the end. Those were both unforeseeable to Miss Gutierrez. Gee, if only it was somebody's job to check for those things. Like. The judge instructed you on, you all are the sole judge of the facts. You all are deciding the facts, ladies and gentlemen. And your verdict should not be based on speculation, yes. guess, or conjecture. <laughs> it goes back to the tampering charge. Um, it goes back to some of the other aspects the government has told you. In this country, we can't decide and convict people on guesses. And that's a lot of what they've asked you to do in several areas, to guess, to assume, to speculate. It's not sufficient to convict people in this country to guess. It's not. And that's what they brought you and they've asked you to do on the tampering and other aspects of their charges. That's the problem with the, with this close is that it didn't feel like a guess when they're like, let's walk through this, ant like through this cartridge, this live round through multiple days. It's not sufficient. Ladies and gentlemen, Hannah is not guilty on all the counts because of the law that her honor has given you. When you apply that law and you apply the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, she could not anticipate what Baldwin would do. It was not in the script. It was not foreseeable. Management was responsible for safety failures and not Hannah. You see how he's looping? You see how he's now repeating himself and repeating himself and repeating himself? That's poor prep. Um, Morrissey didn't end up looping like this. She didn't end up repeating herself. She just made her points. She moved through her story and she went on. People hate when you start repeating yourself. He was right about the tampering and they not guilty did. Yep. I think that, I mean, the prosecutor spent five minutes on the tampering out of her whole thing. I think it was intended that the jury, like if there were any holdouts, they could say, well, we won't convict on the tampering. I think that was a zero evidence sacrificial cocaine, no charge. Testing. And again, I go back to the idea that Hannah is a scapegoat for all the management failures. They do hope she gets convicted, so they're all exonerated. They can move forward. They can finish that movie like Mr. Sousa said they did and make their money. But as he also told you, the buck always stops with production, and it's their responsibility. In any organization, it goes from the top down. And that's where the responsibility lies in this case. That's what OSHA said, and that's also the truth. And the truth is important because justice for Helena does not mean injustice for Hannah. That's a good line. That's an excellent line. Justice for Elena doesn't mean injustice for Hannah. The problem is, is no one believes, <laughs> like no one believes it's an injustice right now. Does not mean injustice for Hannah. It does not mean they get to steamroll her and they get to come in and spin their version of facts and they get to call it truth. Because that's not true. Truth is bringing you Ladies and gentlemen, everything they can. Justice is bringing you everything they can. Justice is not mocking theories that could come true. That might have been the case. Just he's upset that they're mocking him. He's upset about that, right? This is he's getting a little too close to it. He's getting a little too personal. This is not laughing in court during some of our exchanges. And you can evaluate that as to their credibility, whether that was professional. Whether she didn't take court seriously, did she take the investigation seriously? If she didn't take, is she, is he talking about the prosecutor here? Cause if he's saying if she didn't take, like attacking the prosecutor's credibility is inappropriate. I submit she did not. And so they can't come in here with a straight face and mock us and criticize us and tell you they have given you enough to convict her behind a reasonable doubt because they haven't. Tell the jury again how the other side is making fun of you. Tell them about how you're a big joke. Like, 
that's a that's a bad idea. You're this is not the time to settle your hurt feelings, sir. Especially if the, I would not have touched this at all because you know what the jury might be thinking about. Oh yeah, when should you not laugh? When you were in the room giving your second statement, you shouldn't have laughed, sir. Thank you. State's reply. I'm just going to go back to this again. So he's finished. Watch, watch Morrissey when he's finishing up. Thank you. She pushes back, taking off the overcoat. Getting ready to go. <laughs> this is like the moment when somebody walks up to another person at the bar and you see them take their jacket off. It's like, ooh, something's going down. The other thing is that often after like one side talks, the other side will be like, I need five minutes or something. I need a little short break. She does not say I need a short break. She's just like, I am ready to ready to roll. I'll begin while the gentlemen are setting up the uh, Elmo for me. She's just like, I don't need a break. I'm good to go. Hannah didn't know there was a live round on set. I agree. If Hannah knew there was a live round on set and she loaded it into a prop gun and it was used to kill Helena Hutchins, she wouldn't be charged with involuntary manslaughter. She'd be charged with second degree murder. She'd be charged with first degree depraved mind murder. This is an involuntary manslaughter charge because she didn't know there were live rounds on set and the reason she didn't know was through her own negligence her own recklessness, her own willful disregard for the safety of other people. That willful disregard, that lack of care for the safety of other people that you have seen throughout this trial, it is shocking. <laughs> She's just like, nope, we're we're not playing that one like yeah she didn't know that's what she's on trial for sir is not knowing the not knowing says she's guilty oh man that is a um yeah roosevelt media news says defense made a point of prosecution laughing at him in front of the jury because i believe it will be one of his points for appeal if it is i can tell you i don't think that point is going to hunt um, I don't think that dog's going to hunt, and I'm going to tell you why. If you want to make an issue of that, you have to raise it with the judge, and you have to ask for, you know, did he ask for a mistrial over that? Did he ask for a, um, uh, did he ask for some sort of jury instruction? Did he ask for anything? Because if he didn't raise objection to it, if he didn't complain about it contemporaneously, he doesn't get to wait. You cannot be a malicious law squirrel where you just save issues for appeal. Um, I, I don't, I don't think this one's going to fly at all. So, for Mr. Bowles to come up to this podium and say it wasn't foreseeable that Alec Baldwin was going to go off script and pull the hammer and pull the trigger, he showed you a video of Alec Baldwin going off script. Alec Baldwin went off script. Hannah Gutierrez knew it. She was there. Hannah Gutierrez knew that Baldwin was loose. She knew it. She didn't do anything about it, even though it was her job. It was her job. It is Pause. her job to say to an alien. Rewind like 10 seconds. And I've, I got to switch to keep you from echoing here. Sorry. Oh, it's all good. Um, 10 seconds back. Yeah. All right. Let's swap the audio 
and then we'll roll here. It is shocking. Wait for it. Mr. Bowles, to come up to this podium and say it wasn't foreseeable that Alec Baldwin was going to go off script and pull the hammer and pull the trigger, he showed you a video of Alec Baldwin going off script. Alec Baldwin went off script. Hannah Gutierrez knew it. She was there. Hannah Gutierrez knew that Baldwin was loose. She knew it. Pause. She didn't do anything about it, even though it was her job. That pose. Right there. The teapot? You you know it. I know it. One hand on the shoulder, one hand on the podium. She's just... She is... This is like prime prosecutor, like prime attorney, to be honest. Like this is just the point where she just knows that she's got nothing. Like she doesn't have a dummy in her, uh, in, you know, in her magazine right here. It's just nope. live rounds and she can just pull the trigger however many times she feels like it. Um, she's not reading from her notes. This is ad lib. And it's perfect. <laughs> she, that line she delivers earlier of, um, she's charged with involuntary manslaughter. If she knew, she'd be charged with second degree. Or I was first in, degree in, depraved or, mind. Or first degree <laughs> depraved mind. I was instantly going. That is so solid. That is such a good argument. And she's just coming up with this on the fly here. Oh yeah, and. The other thing is you've got, you know, Bowles sets her up and doesn't realize it because he's like, oh, yeah, you know, how could she know that he's going to do it when he played the video of Baldwin going off line, right? Well, and I made the comment. Here's here's the big problem with Bowles. Nothing that he said it eliminates Hannah's liability. It no. might spread it around. It might say we can find everyone guilty of this, but nothing eliminates her liability. Yep. All of this uh, just basically and, and, says she's guilty. And she feeds off of it and she does a phenomenal job. This pose tells you, oh no, I'm going to come hammer this point home because I know this. Yeah. And she just, and somebody said that they want malicious law squirrel merch. Well, I do actually have some malicious law squirrel merch on my, uh, <laughs> on my Zazzle store. Um, along with, I ordered a food and this is brick. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> the latest edition is the, I appreciate you shirt. I mean, the, the only question that, that the jury did you catch had, the, I appreciate the, you thing. I did. The only question <laughs> that the jury had at the, at the conclusion of these closing arguments was, uh, you know, well, it's not even that. A, um, it was, does it break causation? It was essentially, does it break causation? Yeah. Does it break it? Somebody else could have taken a step. And right? no, like, yeah. and, and there was nothing in this trial that showed you a causal break. Nothing. Yeah. And that's that's the main problem he's got. So yeah. why does that problem exist? Why does that problem exist? Because he let his client sit for a second interview and he voluntarily consented to a search of the phone. I I don't get that at all. Like I am so I do my best. Um I leave for a moment and there's a wild rob. Um, I do my best to try to keep clients out of the interview room, right? I tell them to not provide a statement, not a first statement, not a second statement, nothing. And what happens? Well, um, they, they absolutely do, right? They do anyway. But I'm certainly not bringing my client in for a second statement with me sitting there looking like, you know, I, I don't know what's going on, right? Um, yeah. 
what would amount to an intervening cause? Um, Dave Hall's intentionally loaded a live round. Or honestly, Alec Baldwin noticing the round. Like if Alec Baldwin would have checked the gun himself and yep. then reclosed it, I think that would have done it too. Uh, Dave Hall's rechecking it and Dave Hall's like pulling the rounds out and putting them back in. That might have done it. Maybe. I think it's more if Dave Hall's pulls out a like pulls out a dummy and loads a live cartridge, then we've got an intervening cause. Or yeah. I don't know. Um yeah, I don't know if the I appreciate you merch is yet um visible, but uh It'll be on the store soon. Um, Zazzle takes a moment to post things up. Um, we can do, we can do like, yeah, I know guy merch. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I like this. Yeah, I know merch. Great idea. Phenomenal. Thank you, someone else. The, uh, yeah. All right. I'm going to switch the audio <laughs> over. And... <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I'm just having some fun. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth Webb. Let's, um, what is it? Let's switch the audio back and have a look at this one. Cause, oh my God. Um, yeah. The... It was her job. It is her job to say to an A-list actor, if in fact, that's what you want to call him. Um, Hey, you can't behave that way. with. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> It is her job to say great. That was phenomenal. If that's what you want to call him, I'm like, I mean, like, great burn, great burn. (laughs) My gosh, Carrie Morrissey. I (laughs) wow, if that's what you want to call him, solid. (laughs) That was that was some amazing shade. That yep. was just like, oh my god! Um, and that's not easy to pull off when you're going from the when you're shooting from the hip. Like that, <laughs> well, not to not to say that light that term loosely, but yeah, when you're shooting from the hip, that's not a uh, easy thing to do. Oh, it was just beautiful. Like, if that's what you want to call him, um, that by the way is also she's already winding Baldwin up. Because she's hoping Baldwin decides to testify. Oh, God. You know what she wants most of all? Most of everything? I... You know what? So does the internet. So does the internet. The internet wants it. His attorneys are going to fight really hard against his urge. Because, Ian, you know, he wants to explain. He very much wants to explain how the mechanics of this gun works. And you know what? Experts be damned. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, I I don't, I don't get it at all. Like, um, I, I just, like, <laughs> Baldwin will be fun. Baldwin, and you know what I'm doing? If I'm Morrissey, you know what I'm doing later? Baiting him. I mean, aside, well, aside from having like a, a big old glass of wine, I'm probably drafting a letter to Ms. Hannah Gutierrez. And you know what the letter says? We will, we will, uh, Either go soft on sentencing. We'll do a month on sentencing. Mm-hmm. You I'm served. wave. You wave we'll appeals. Accelerate. You wave appeals. And you testify. And you testify. Ooh. Is Bulls counsel? Because Bulls might agree to that. Bulls is counsel. Bulls has. I don't think Bulls is going to agree to it. Bulls has said he's going to appeal. And you can see Bulls is the hurt way. feeling squad here, right? On he is the hurt grounds? feeling squad. On what so, grounds? The appellate record is is trash. Like, there's no grounds. The 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 main ground I would argue, if I was Bulls, is the admission of the drug evidence. 
That's what I argue. No, you're not getting it because the jury the jury came back with, with a NG on that, right? Yep. And you know what else? So they're going to say the appeals court is going to say even if that was an error, yeah, there was so harmless. much evidence that it was a harmless error. And yeah, you're done. and they're going to say harmless as evidenced by the fact the jury came back with an NG. Like, and the jury that, came back in uh, like 20 hot minutes. <laughs> yeah, like that is probably. I mean, it's it's a it's a not to say a meritless appeal, but you're not getting anywhere with that. You don't get your client out of jail. Honestly, if you're advocating for your client's best interests, I would entertain the offer. I, I would be it. seriously tempted. I don't um, hate it. You know what? The like, other one I would be tempted to. I mean, you know what? I might counter offer if I'm. Hey, if I'm guessing, if I'm you, I would say. Uh, Deviate from the felony. Allow me to repossess gun rights. Um, give me time served and I'll testify. Close. Yeah. Um, I would say drop the felony. Yeah. Uh, like ditch the felony. And instead of the felony, I will um, like give us the misdemeanor. Yep. And yeah, she keeps her gun rights. She's able to eventually get the gun later. Give I, me time I, served and I will spill the beans on everything, Alec. Yeah, exactly. So um, I'd take it. I'd advise my client take it. I I'd take it, um, but she's already been convicted. I don't think that that prevents them from taking the deal at this point. Doesn't not with an appeal pending. So yeah. Um, I think they're fine. Um, people are wondering who is the guy in the background with the suit and blue shirt looking at the prosecutor with such disgust. Um, that's all Hannah's friends and family and so forth. So, yeah. All right. Let's, um, I'm switching it over to echo mode thing again here. Those firearms, that is her job. That is what they pay her for. That is the job that she applied for. That is the job that she accepted. foreseeability you want to talk about off script just remember those videos of the stuntman that's not within the script she was there she watched it she knew these people would go off script you know she didn't check the rounds i'm not saying she i want it rounds. i'm saying that i would that movie set the entire time this is the undetected. deal i'd be seeking if i was the uh if i was the defense Given everything we've got you have absolutely everything we have this law enforcement team and this team of prosecutors have reviewed thousands and thousands and thousands of photos and thousands of videos. We have interviewed countless people, many of whom you didn't even hear from. We can't stay here forever. You have absolutely everything you need. One of the amazingly shocking things about this case to me has always been, and it's to Detective Hancock's credit, a defense attorney with his own agenda, no question, comes to her and- I would object. Oh, shit. Um, I would object to that. I, I think would. that's improper. I I would, but I will say Morrissey's on a roll. Like, sh do not let her close. I've told people this in the chat earlier. We were talking about this trial. Morrissey has proven herself to be a remarkable litigator. Like, I would object good. to that. I would. I would. Like, you don't normally stand up and object in a close. I would stand up and object to that. But he doesn't. But he doesn't. And it's a... This is where he could have gotten an appealable issue. I would have stood but, up. I would have said objection. Go up to have the sidebar. You say, I need a, I need a mistrial. But That's, here's the thing. In pushing back on your point, I agree. But there's, there's like training, behavioral training throughout, throughout trial. Right. Every objection that she made, he never fought ever. Yeah. So she has, I hate to use the word trained him, but she has a good feel. She knows she he's not going to object. She didn't train him. He just was that way from the beginning. Yeah. But she knows he's not going to object. So she can do this. 
He's not that kind of lawyer because that would be good lawyering. <laughs> That's the problem. He's not the good kind of lawyer is the problem. Um, yeah. That's outside the bounds. It's, it's, but if he's not going to object, what are you going to do? Yep. All right. I'm going to switch yep. back to echo mode. Um, the reason why it echoes is my, cause my audio feeds back in order to make this work. I got to figure out a better system for it, but it is. It is. Um, Shocking. You have absolutely everything you need. One of the amazingly shocking things about this case to me has always been, and it's to Detective Hancock's credit, a defense attorney with his own agenda, no question, Whew. comes to her and says, it's Seth Kinney, it's Seth Kinney, it's Seth Kinney. That's his job. Okay, let's make that clear. That's Mr. Bowles' job. He gets Hannah's dad to say, it's Seth Kinney, it's Seth Kinney, it's Seth Kinney. Rather than ignore them, she gets a search warrant. She took his speculative agenda, presented it to a judge, got a search warrant, and searched that man's property. And oh my heavens, what did they find? They found exactly what Thel Reed said they would find. They found live ammunition with semi-wad cutter projectiles. You have everything you have, you, you, you have everything we have, you have everything you will ever need to convict her. This is 100% foreseeable. They really, like, he really needed to object there. Yeah. That was. And you see he bit his lip like he was debating it. Stop debating. Get up off your Get butt. up. It's tough because the, the principles are normally that you don't object unless, during a close, unless it really matters. Get up off your ass now, sir. I mean, this, this jury returned a verdict in, like, two hours. So... So I would want that mistrial objection on the record. Yeah. I That's your to. appeal. That's your appeal. Right? That's your appeal. So, and M, uh, I understand you might be with Alex team. I mean, feel free to give me a shout if you want. My email address is in the about section. Um, I think Alex team is going to be a very different ball game. Oh, yeah. Because Alex team is not going to be sitting there like a fungus on that chair. Uh, at this moment, right? No, but I think Alex's team has a lot more to work against than Hannah's does. E and I know that's going to sound crazy to say, but Alec gave a lot of bad more statements. Very definitive, like definitive statements. My hand was not on the trigger, but then says fanning. And then you have a video of his finger on the trigger as he pulls it out. Like, Honestly, Alex's team has a lot of really hard stuff to overcome. You're muted. Okay, hopefully that's fixed it. Uh, my fixed. my mic did a blip. Um, Alec also says, like, it would be really stupid to point the trigger, like, point at somebody and pull the trigger. And they're going to be able to prove that that's exactly what he did. Who says what yeah. Alec did was improper? Alec says that. Alec. Mm -hmm. and that's the problem he's got. Oh, well, let's uh, let's keep going here because. Yeah. Hannah Gutierrez is not a scapegoat. Hannah Gutierrez is not being treated as a scapegoat. Mr. Halls was charged criminally. To his credit, he took an early plea and he got the benefit of that. Mr. Baldwin has now been indicted. Everyone with criminal culpability has been criminal. Great line. Like, great line. Now, not permissible. Not allowed. You can't do that. But bulls ain't you, moving. Bulls not moving. You, you cannot, and, and to clarify, like, you as the prosecutor cannot say don't worry about convicting this person because we have the other people lined up as well. You can't do that. That's not allowed because you're suggesting to them that they can convict feeling comfortable that they will also go after the other people. You can't do that. This is supposed to be looked at independent of those prosecutions. Yeah. And the thing is, is that he somewhat opened the door to this by saying that she's the scapegoat, but I, 
I mean, this this is some place he could have objected if he didn't want to sit there. I mean, he's having a nap. It's it's all good. Miss. Criminally charged in this case. She's not being scapegoated. She is being treated like everyone else. She is not being given a break because she's a woman. She is not being given a break because she's young. Because that's not how the law works. Blink, blink, blink. Good line. Let me just review my notes real quick. And as I promised you, I am going to try to speed this up for you. Please keep in mind, Mr. Bowles comes up to the podium and says, Sarah Zachary threw rounds away. She did. Obviously, she did. She admitted it. She told law enforcement that she did it. And rather than try to prosecute her for tampering with evidence, for panicking and throwing some rounds away, she agreed to come in and testify. And her agreement is that she must testify truthfully. And she testified truthfully. You want to know why we don't have an inertia puller in evidence? Why we don't have a box of dummies that Ms. Gutierrez said she brought on set? She said she brought two boxes. We've only got one. You want to know why? Because she went to the prop truck on October 23rd, got Boss. access to it, took a bunch of gun belts, and a couple you cannot freaking say why things are not in evidence. You cannot refer to things that did not make it into evidence at all in your closing. That is so outside the bounds that you, that is that is remarkable. Like you no, cannot. I disagree. He oh, said these things on. are not in evidence. He's he's pointing to these things. Did as he being raise not in this? Evidence. Yes, he raised it. He raised that there's oh. no inertia puller. He's he's raising, like, where are these things? And then she's allowed to say, well, here's a plausible yep. explanation okay, for where I take it, it back. could have gone. I take it back. He invited it. Why did he invite it? Why did he open that door? Because you know what else she has fair game to do? She has fair game to say. You know what else wasn't in evidence? I mean, she doesn't because that would be a mistrial. Uh, Hannah Gutierrez and the boyfriend. Mm, yeah, that that that's too that far. would be mistrial. That'd be but, a mistrial. But if we're talking opening the door and inviting things that were not introduced in evidence that the it jury was could in, consider, it was in evidence that she went into the prop truck to retrieve some stuff. And so as an explanation for where's the missing stuff is she went into the prop truck. She got some stuff that you could have been the stuff. You can't cite what's not in evidence. You can when you're saying here's an explanation for it. And there is evidence that there was a prop uh, that there was a an inertia puller. There is evidence that of there being an inertia puller. It's not like there's just nothing there. She's just saying the reason why we don't have the physical object is it probably went missing at that point. Okay, that's a little different. Because we heard from Pickle, uh, I think it was. I think it was Ms. Yes. Pickle that we heard. Yeah, Ms. Pickle. Uh, was the that, line producer. That she, she asked for a, uh, you know, that she ordered an inertia puller and then billed it for reimbursement. So there's evidence of there being an inertia puller. Yeah. At that point, it is reasonable to say, where does the inertia puller go? Yeah, so. that's fair. All right, let's uh, roll on here. Couple of boxes. I'm okay. Finally. That's what he's objecting to? I know. After everything else. Yeah, he sits there like, while she impugns him, and then, yeah. Well, it's just like the interviews. Like, cat's out of the bag. Your Honor, I would, I would object. Uh, I'm going to agree to a voluntary search of my client's cell phone. Your Honor, I object to using the substance of that search. N no. The well, not just that. He asked for a stay of proceedings based on that search. Where are we? Um, I'm she seeing... took stuff out of the prop truck. She took gun belts. You heard from Sarah Zachary that those were gun belts that she brought from another movie set that were already loaded with dummy rounds. Who knows what was in them? So I want to... Make sure that we understand Spammer's what banned. reasonable doubt means. Reasonable doubt means the doubt must be reasonable. 
it is not a reasonable doubt to like him cast suspicion or... on Brian Norvell. It is not a reasonable doubt to cast suspicion on Seth Kinney. All investigative leads were exhausted. He simply didn't do anything wrong. You want to talk about scapegoating? That's the guy mm -hmm. that got scapegoated. <laughs> Missed opportunity, as that admitted was, by their own expert. I don't have to prove this case beyond yeah. all possible doubt. If that is what the law required, my heavens, we live in a world of infinite possibilities. The government would never be able to prove a case beyond all possible doubt. We'd have to have... I love the, my heavens. Like, that's the what? kind of thing where you could just... Yeah. Dude, she's good on her feet. It's she not is. A standard, and it doesn't have to be the standard. So when you're back there and you're talking about doubt, make sure it's a reasonable one under this set of circumstances. Good line. Good also, it line. looks like Streamyard is managing to eat the echo here, so that's good. You know, Mr. Bowles says to you, these production outfitters were just from one day. That's right. All that happened in one day. Imagine what all the other days were like. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> 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 what a line wow she, she is and this so is much. like this is pure reaction to his thing and she didn't even take a, a breather to stop and redo this she just like someone take away her notepad like that's what i mean someone in that office take away her notepad like really just take it away like, give her bullet point lists and just let her go. Don't let her read oh, off script. She's doing great. Mr. Balls is right. The crew didn't believe there were live rounds on set. They believed that she was going to do her job. They believed <laughs> that she did her job. This isn't Seth Kenny's responsibility to inventory rounds, although he did it. That wasn't his responsibility. Rust Productions didn't provide all of the dummy rounds to the set of this movie. You know from her own statements she brought two boxes on herself. We're not living in an alternate reality. <laughs> All right. Let's go through these. I'll go through them relatively quickly. When you all go back into the jury deliberation room, you will have your own copy. Uh, so you certainly will have a copy to reference. Um, these are some of the instructions that are important oh, to us. Oh, says copy. I mean, they'll probably have coffee, too. Your verdict should not be uh, based on sympathy or prejudice. Although they don't really have time sympathy to drink it. Huh? <laughs> oh. Oh, I see. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Dude. Well, it can't be based on sympathy or mm. prejudice. And for any of you who are feeling sympathetic, because she is young and she is maybe inexperienced, although by her own statement to Detective Hancock, she would tell you she wasn't. Good move. <laughs> yep. You all are on this jury because during voir dire, you agreed to follow the law. And I will ask you to do it right now. If you had said during voir dire, I can't follow the law, I feel too sympathetic, you wouldn't be here. And if you can't follow the law, you can probably excuse yourselves. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. You could probably go excuse yourself. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah, she's just you know, not. I I also I'm just gonna play this back at one time speed. Watch God, behind her. Sympathetic, you wouldn't be here. And if you can't follow the law, you can probably excuse yourselves. Bowles is like, oh shit! He's looking. Do you see Bowles look over towards the jury? Yeah, it, that is a... And Hannah wants to have a moment, and he's like, um... Uh, no. No. No, he, he says no. He literally says no. He says, now's not the time. No, no, no. We're, we're not having a chat now. Wow. Fuck. I've never seen a prosecutor do that. You must not concern yourselves with the consequences of your verdict. That is the law. That is the law that you agreed to follow. That is the law that you are required to follow. <laughs> I don't like her, but I like her now. By, hand, by handling yep. or using a firearm in a negligent manner, there can be absolutely no doubt. That happened. Hannah Gutierrez should have known of the danger involved by her actions. Yeah, she knew. 
This was completely foreseeable. She was trained in firearms. She knows what we all know. Guns can kill you. You got to be really careful. Her act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. 12A is the alternative theory. And so let me explain to you that 12 and 12A are alternatives. You must find, you must make a decision about guilt or innocence unanimously to the count, not to the alternatives. So Wait, can I you pause can for say, a second? I think she's guilty of 12, but not. Yep. Uh, it was, it was this comment here. Hang on. Um, Crap, hang on. I, I found it because there's a really good comment. This one. It's a bit too chastising. I disagree because Bowles, when Bowles got up there, I think Ian and I would both agree that Bowles gave a lot of very gray interpretations of the law. Like Bowles, when he explained what culpability was or what liability was, or you know, how you yeah. could find someone willfully. Uh, disregarding or willful um, neglect, right? And Bowles led the jury to believe that willfully was manifesting some intent, like that Hannah had to intend for this to happen. It was yeah. not the accurate articulation of the law. What Morrissey is doing here isn't chastising. It is firmly correcting. It is instructing. It is very effective. It is basically affirmatively saying with all the confidence that she can muster, this is the law you have to convict because A, B, C, D, E. This is the quite literally probably one of the better rebuttal clothes you will ever see. Oh, it's and the thing is, is this is part of how she saves stuff. She saved all of this for for that, right? So, yeah, she she saved this and was proceeding but uh all right let's uh yep pull see down. More. 12a another six of you can say we think she's guilty of 12a but not 12 done you're done and a lot of people are pointing out she's not likable you don't have to like her she's convincing anna gutierrez loaded live ammunition into a firearm yes she certainly did she told the police she did she failed to perform an adequate safety check of the ammunition. Of course, you know that. She didn't do it just once. She did it numerous times. She acted with willful disregard for the safety of others, without question. So you are being presented with what's called a lesser included offense. And I will remind you the instructions that the judge read you at the beginning. Um, your first job is to see if you can agree on involuntary manslaughter. If you find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter, on either alternative, you do not move on to this misdemeanor. It's done. If you find her not guilty of involuntary manslaughter, then you get to move on to the misdemeanor. You've heard a lot about that, I'll skip it. This is what we call a general criminal intent instruction and I want to just make sure that you understand this instruction only applies to the tampering with evidence. It does not apply to the involuntary manslaughter because she is charged with negligent homicide, not intentional. This is so good. Like this is, I don't like her. Very this importantly, cool. that's the thing. Cause jury instructions, these jury instructions. If you had to pick like which person to go and like spend a week traveling across the country with, Never. I'd probably pick Bowles. Yeah. Bowles seems a lot more likable. Like, I would like hanging out with Bowles more. Assuming Bowles didn't know I, who I was, because I suspect now he might, you know, smother me with a pillow or something. But um, she, on the other hand, is who I want defending me. If I'm... And I, I think Hannah's sitting there going like, can I trade lawyers? <laughs> <laughs> or prosecuting the person that harmed me. That's the thing. Like, I want her prosecuting the person that harmed me. Like, or that other caused a harm to my family member. Like, if my family member was a victim on this set, this is what I want prosecuting that. 
Like, I want this. And the other dude, DA, is actually, yeah, I'd pick him over the Bulls. He's good. He is he's really so good. Nice. And he's got this great soft cross style mm-hmm. where I don't think I saw him get angry at anybody or anything like that. He's just, um, he just really gets all of the information he wants. And I bet, yeah, he's he's the guy to go for uh, for a beer. But this is I would a totally take the second chairs. Yes. Um, well, this is but this this Morrissey's rebuttal close is literally this is a litigator's close. This is a closing argument that you want from a trial attorney. This has all of the passion and doesn't skip past any of the facts. Like she is pulling up every single standard, all the instructions and walking through them and clarifying. Yeah. All of the other arguments like this is a trial attorney's close. And I have to, uh, whoop. which means I also have to run. Where is it here? Have to run that. Uh, thank you, Jeremy Morton. Two hours behind it two times. I had mixed feelings. I tend to start a trial wanting the state to prove something and change my mind. But her job was to make sure the deadly weapons are treated respectfully and safely. And she clearly failed spectacularly. I agree. Um, She was horrifically bad at that. And Emily, thank you for the 20 gifted memberships. Thank you. Um, All right, let's, let's keep rolling here. She's almost done are what allows you Drag us down. to find Ms. Gutierrez guilty, even though Mr. Baldwin may have also been a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. Yes. So let's go through it. And that's the thing. She can address those death was a foreseeable like, result. bad Helena points Gutierrez without fear. Into a firearm. Of course it was. The act of the defendant was a significant cause of the death of Helena Hutchins. The defendant's act was a significant cause of death if it was an act which, in a natural and continuous chain of events, uninterrupted by an outside event, resulted in the death, and without which, the death would not have occurred. She brought a bunch of live rounds on set, accidentally, but negligently. She loaded one of them can into you, a prop Can you play this at real speed? After. Because they were this is into good. Jensen Ackers, um, you know, she brought one to death, and without which... Real speed. Which, the death would not have occurred. She brought a bunch of live rounds on set, accidentally, but negligently. She loaded one of them into a prop gun, and this was after they were loaded into Jensen Ackles' gun belt and Alec Baldwin's holster. And she told Dave Halls, this is a cold gun. He told the crew it's a cold gun. At that point, everyone certainly assumed that there wasn't a live round. She knew Baldwin would go off script. She didn't have prop duties to tend to. She walked out. And even if she had been there, it wouldn't have made a difference because you have seen the incredible lack of control that she exercised as the only person on the movie set in charge of firearms. Look at Hannah's expression. She's like, I have the worst lawyers right now. (laughs) This is the argument you and I've been making the whole time. Yeah. Like we've, we've been saying this, this whole trial, even before the trial, like there, I've been waiting for her to tie it together. Yeah. And the thing is, is she's, she laid all the pieces and I was like, why aren't you assembling this together today? She strung it all together and she dropped like, and I was just like, Oh my God, this is what I was waiting for the whole trial. And she just, um, and she waited for rebuttal close, which is her MO. She waits for rebuttal. Like oh, she absolutely. doesn't like her her direct her openings they suck but rebuttal she goes ham she's a shark 
She she just lurks under the water and then suddenly it's all teeth and blood and screaming. And that's kind of where she is. Um, took her yeah. 10 days to build the puzzle and she dropped the mic and walked off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Effectively. Like she has just been stringing things together and stringing things together and so forth. And at the end of it, it's this giant landmine that she just set out in front of bulls and watched them walk into it. Um, it. It's, yeah. There is no intervening event. If you think the intervening event is that Baldwin manipulated the gun, that was that's the whole purpose of the prop. <laughs> He's going to manipulate it. You saw a bunch of other actors do it. Oh, that's so two-faced. It's so Very good. Important. It's so two-faced. There may be more it's so two-faced because she's going to charge him for no. doing it. <laughs> no, and in, in like three months' time, we're going to see the same argument like in reverse. The thing but, is, is defense could have hammered her on this and doesn't. That's the thing. This is where she opens defense up to go after her, and he doesn't. And... She can she can get away with so much because she knows he's napping. And there's times when I'm just like, you, sir, need to like you need to pull that chain. You need to stop her. But if the acts it's of fear so or and significantly contribute to the cause of death, each act is a significant cause of death. Each act. And that's the ball. Yes. Cause of death. That's OK. You can still convict her. <laughs> that's a great line. If you God, think Baldwin is Baldwin, line. convict her, you know, convict her. Jury instruction 20. This is the one the jury has a question about later, by the way. If you find the, neglig the negligence of a person other than the defendant was the only significant cause of death or constitutes an intervening cause that breaks the foreseeable chain of events, the defendant is not guilty. Well, that's not this case. She brought the five <laughs> rounds on the live round in a prop gun. That's the reason that Ms. Hutchins is dead. One of at least two reasons. Oh my God. Yeah. I will again, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I know that this has been hard work for you folks. Um, I will ask you to find Ms. Gutierrez guilty of involuntary manslaughter <clears throat> and tampering with evidence. And I will ask you to bring some justice to Helena Hutchins. Thank you. <clears throat> The jury at this point has had to see two dead bodies because right at the beginning of the trial, they got shown the autopsy photos of Helena Hutchins. Oh, and right now it. they're don't seeing bulls yep. on the ground bleeding. I it's knew like, say it. of course I was going to say it. Um, so then we go to jury deliberations, which take a good long while. And then Slash I think two get, hours. And then we get a question. And the question takes a hot minute because everyone's got to come back in. But we get to hear that there's a jury question. And everyone files back in because... And the reason why they need everyone there is so that, the, so that they can address the jury question, make submissions on that. Cleopatra. I believe you said Bowles was the second dead body. She Just, took him out. I, <laughs> she took him out. It was that was that was a. She was like was standing an, behind the grassy knoll here, and just like there was, there was, it was, there was no negligence involved. That was intentional. It was uh, pre-planned. It was uh, a lot. There's Hannah coming back in. You can see the guy in the green camo seems to know her. Um, I don't know who he is. Like, is that a new boyfriend? Wait, is that Ian, a the chat saying this is the verdict. This is not the verdict. Okay. I don't think. This is listed as jury question on the timestamps. This is not the verdict, I don't think. Okay. I don't think this is verdict. 
People are saying it is. We'll know soon. I mean, if it's verdict, then oh well. Sure. Yeah, this is verdict. Has to be. Yeah. Timestamp might be screwy. If it's Wait, the verdict, we'll watch so the verdict. Either way, either way, either way, pause, pause and recap the question. So the question that uh, the question that gets asked, uh, jury question wasn't shown. Okay, that's fair. Um, I thought it was on there. I thought that they had the uh, the question that gets asked is that um, basically, do they? Um, so there's the the question on intervening cause, and it was basically something along the lines of, "What if someone else could have stopped it?" Right. What if someone else could have prevented this? Baldwin and calls Zachary. Yeah. And the judge says, tough. I'm not answering that question. Jury, you figure that out. Because you get to decide what an intervening cause is. That's fair, actually. Neither the prosecution nor the defense objects to that. Yeah, that's that's a fair interpretation of the law. Like you, yep. the jury is the one who decides. Yep. So, yeah. And that there's that uh, question. And then like 20 minutes later, the verdict comes in. All right. Right. So. All right. Just just a minute. All right. Wait. At the back here. Is Thel Reed? Okay. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, through the four person, have you reached a verdict? Yes. All right. Let me see the verdict. It's a quick verdict. It's a lightning fast verdict. Good night, EDB. Good night, Emily. Oof. The hot sauce is hot. Day. That's a lot. Yes. Hot sauce is hot. Yeah, I know it is. I, I've had it. It's really good. I still have <laughs> some. I got to decide if I'm checking luggage, because if I am, I'm bringing some bottles. Uh, to me? To Vancouver. Hmm. I'll bring some bottles to you when I fly out, because you've got an event I want to attend. You mean a wedding? Correct. Yes. All right, so let me repeat. That read is not who mom was and, apparently angry about. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, through the four person, have you reached a verdict? Yes. All right, and do you wish to read the verdicts? Sure. Okay. I would start with uh, count one. Okay. Will the defendant please stand? I don't believe you, Ian. Dave Hall's announced it as cold sauce. <laughs> it's a bad, but a good joke. It is. Guilty of voluntary manslaughter as charged in count one. We find the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, not guilty of charges in count two. All right, thank you. You may be seated. Let me get those forms, retrieve those forms from you. I'm going to do what's called polling the jury. Now, people said she's got no reaction. You can actually see she does have a reaction. Back up. Back up. You can see she does have a reaction. Anna Gutierrez, guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one. She yeah. she's got a reaction. Anna Gutierrez, not guilty of tampering with evidence. This charge should come to. All right, thank you. Ladies. She knew it was coming. To treat those forms from you, I'm going to do what's called. She knew it was coming, or she was well prepped. She knew um, it was coming. I I always prep. I always prep my clients to say, "You may be convicted. You may be acquitted. Either way, I want you not to react, because." You know what I hate is when a client is um, is acquitted and they go, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. you you need to not look like you just won the lottery, sir. You need to look like it was, you know, just nod over to the court and then we'll move on. 
But she, um, she was yeah. breathing really fast from the moment the judge said stand up. That oh, it, I mean, that's not your that's not your tell. The tell is the the blinking. Everybody everybody breathes fast when they're yeah, the, waiting for the verdict. The blinking is what the tell is. Yeah. Polling and, the jury. What I need to put on the record is that this is your individual verdict. Okay. So I'm going to start with the gentleman in the back. Is this your uh, verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is this your verdict? Sir, is this your verdict? Yes. 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 Ma'am, is this your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is this your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is this your verdict? Ma'am, is this your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is this your verdict? Okay, thank you. All right, so you've completed your service. Um, thank you so much for um, being here. It was a, it was a long uh, trial. Uh, I wonder who she is. Yeah, that was weird. She's not sitting with Hannah's peeps or anyone. I didn't People get that. Talk to you. Um, you know, this has been pretty much a lot of publicity, and you don't have to. Okay. So you can just simply say, I do not, do not wish to talk and move on. And if anybody bothers you, we really try to protect your privacy. If anybody bothers you, simply call um, uh, my division and, um, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, figure out what to do. But you I'm also not talking about not. the woman behind okay. Hannah. I'm so talking the woman with the yellow glasses. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I, I, you can escort them out. Right. I want to see the reaction to the next part. Do you have the motion? Remand? Yes. So the jury's getting walked out. You see mom there is crying. She's not happy. That doesn't surprise anybody. All right, you may be seated. Based upon the uh, verdict, Governor, we would request that Ms. Gutierrez be taken into custody. Mr. Bowles? Yeah. So that yeah. surprised me. Yeah, gal and gallery surprised too, and I'm not surprised. That is a that is a regular motion. Regular it's motion. Regular, it's a regular Revoke motion. Bond. In most circumstances, but I here. Know. There's the grounds for it don't really exist. Um, and Bowles is going to read them off of his fucking phone. Watch, watch Bowles, right? So what she's saying is basically until sentencing, Hannah needs to be in jail. And then here's watch Bowles. Uh, we're going to watch this at one speed. I think Wait, if side note, side note, before you do that, every lawyer, by the way, Every criminal defense lawyer, I don't do criminal defense, but every criminal defense lawyer, just like I know the factors for custody law and uh, distribution of property, et cetera. I know the factors like by heart. Every criminal defense lawyer knows the factors for detention, both pretrial and post-trial, like pre-sentencing. They know them by heart. So this part bothered me a lot. The thing is, is I'd know the factors. I would also have them prepped on my, like, ready to go on a sheet so that I can quote them exactly because I don't necessarily want to quote them from memory. But it is clear that he did not prepare for this. The other thing is that every time my client is convicted of something or is about to be, or even if know. I think that their chances are 98% of acquittal, like I am sure they're going to be acquitted. I'm prepared for for the other alternative, right? Because you don't know the jury. You know, it could have been that like Baldwin comes into the court and testifies, "I shot Helena Hutchins because I hated her, and it's not you know it's not Hannah's fault at all." And you still prep that the jury might convict your client. Um, so, and somebody says Hannah's wearing a bullet necklace. No, she isn't. She's been wearing a crystal, like a little stone there the whole time. So. Request, uh, under, uh, you see him looking for it? He doesn't have it. He's scrolling. He's looking up the statute right now.
Your Honor, Rule 5402, uh, release pending sentencing. She knows, like, this is a, a judge. She knows what the rule is. She knows the number of the rule. You don't, yeah. Uh, in this court's discretion, under the same conditions or other conditions as this court would uh, deem necessary. He's reading Ms. it now. Gutierrez has been on uh, conditions. She has not violated those conditions. She has voluntarily appeared at all court proceedings. Um, Your Honor, I would request this court to continue conditions or whatever conditions this court would, would have on release. All right, thank you. You know what I would be saying? Um, I would be prepped for this, and I'm making substantial submissions beyond this, including because he says she can be released on the motion ready to go. I have a written motion ready to go. Like I have something prepped. You do too. I know you do. It might not be a written motion. I like I I might argue this orally. It's just I'm arguing this extensively, and he says on the same conditions or other conditions. What conditions are you suggesting, sir? I'm something. I'm coming in. I've got conditions. Tether. Tether, money, bond. Give them something. Yep. She can put this money up. She will not leave the state of New Mexico. Or even she will not leave the city. She's not going to leave town. It's an old west. Don't leave town. Right? That That's fitting. Uh, she's not going to own a gun. She's not going to any of this. Right? You can lay all that out. You can make the case. And instead... Um. Yeah, I'm going to remand you, and the reason why I'm going to remand you is you are now convicted, and so um, and this is a death. It's an, uh, uh, a criminal negligence, but it's still a death. And so, uh, deputies, you're going to take her into custody, and we will set a sentencing date. What is the best? Uh, what do, what do we want? And there's mom out? freaking out. Guy, I don't know who the guy is. He's freaking out too. Um. And we need an order of remand relief. Yeah. Uh, Council? Uh, in terms of the sentencing date? Yes. At, 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 at the court's convenience. Woman on the left says, give me your necklace. And the judge tips him off, like tips him off, says this is a death, which means that there's likely an exception to that rule that he was looking at for death cases. I which, don't know that that's no, the case. I don't know that there's an exception. I think it's just, it's discretionary and she's providing the reason, which is it's a death, right? Um, so. I would imagine there's a rule. We'll be available. Um, there are two so weeks she says, May that I'm unavailable. Those are the last two weeks of May. You know what I tell my client on this? You know what I, you know what I say is, uh, yeah, I actually thought it was Private Eye Posse. I thought it was her brother. I'm not sure. I was told she might be an only child, so I don't know who it is. But brother is a reasonable conclusion. I always tell my clients to show up on the day of sentencing, like, or on the day of a verdict, ready to go to jail if that's what happens. Yep. <clears throat> and so for for everyone, that means wear nothing valuable. Um you know, no jewelry, no watches, no any of that, because those things get lost. Um, it is also don't, where... Don't drive yourself. Don't drive yourself. Don't drive yourself. Take a taxi, get a friend to drive you, you know, whatever else. Um, for women, don't wear anything with an underwire, because they'll take it. Um, you know, these kinds of things. Um, so... But yeah, she's unprepared. She's having Mr. to get that necklace taken off. Your Honor, as soon as uh, this court has time, we will be available. All right. So, uh, do you have any conflict like that? She said May. Do you have any conflict? May is like. I don't know uh, for sure, Your Honor, that I can. I do have other trials, but I think mid May. Well, I can do it sooner. Okay. I just wondered if you had any conflicts along the way. I doesn't look like mid-May, Your Honor. I, I do. I don't think I have any conflicts. What about sooner? I'm sorry, not understanding. Do you have okay? We're in March. Do you have? Do you have? Early, do you have time before May? We have time in April. Okay. Sure. All right. Okay. All right. Anything?
your client's going into custody, sir, and the judge is hinting you should like, have. We can do it in time. March. We can do it in April. We can do it. We can do it really quick. Like we can do it quickly. Would when you the like judge to is accelerate? That? that sounds like you might not be getting like eighteen months because otherwise the judge doesn't care, right? Um, I think this is time served. Like to be honest, if I'm being honest with you, I think it's time served. I was thinking three months, but you know, she's going to be in there for two months. Um, time, time served. served. Um, maybe some probation on top of that. Right. Um, yeah. Why do they let her take off her stuff and give her phone to her lawyers? Because honestly, they don't want to keep to, to keep it. Um, if she goes into custody, then they have to put that into her property and they have to return it later and it could get lost. It can get damaged. There could be claims over that. They're happier if it goes to someone else. And so, like, they don't want to have to deal with that. They're they're fine with that. So, yeah. Um, Mom is breaking down, and that's before the court. That's to be expected. Hannah is losing it. That's to be expected too. So, um, but she's keeping her poker face. People are really upset about this detention issue. Like, here's the thing. The sentence is a formality. It's going to be okay. We're going to appeal. But like the sentence is a formality. Like the judge is going to give some time. Okay. So yeah. the question is, is that time to be served at a later date when the person has to voluntarily submit themselves to the court or to the jail? Or is that going to start now? And a lot of the law leans towards that starting now. So I'm wondering who this is in the purple hat. Um, because she's not sitting with Hannah's people and she's very much like it's it's an unusual figure and she seems to be very interested in what's going on. But she clears up and you see mom comes after her yelling. Mom is yelling as she's leaving. Did you see that? Back at the judge. She shouts something at the judge, but she also. Yeah. Mom is yelling. She's upset. And some people have said that that's uh, a friend of Helena or Helena's relative. So uh, I'm guessing she was. I'm guessing she found that to be satisfying. She's Helena's friend that's making a documentary. OK. Um, if you want some comment, give me a shout. I would be happy to, you know. Um, somebody says that's the other lady that's suing. Fair enough. Um who let her into court with a backpack? I'm sure that backpack was searched. Yeah. yeah. And you see, oh, um, oh. some she people said that wasn't Thel in the background. That's definitely Thel. Uh, talking to Bowles and them, that is definitely Thel. Um, so, like, um, yeah. you can you can see like he's aged quite a bit. Um, Apparently she's wearing Helena's hat. Ooh, that's that's a person with a grudge. You can see he's aged quite a bit, but that is definitely Thel's face, right? Um, and he's not happy with this. So, I mean, obviously you wouldn't be, right? Oh crap! Uh, <clears throat> wait, find a way to un echo me. Are, are you echoing? So Alex Capra Rieo. Oh, we're going to come to that. Are you going to get to what mom yelled? Um, yes, <laughs> I I'll have to find that out. But uh, I, well, look I did at, see... uh, look at signal because uh, one of our friends who has purple hair uh, highlighted the very tweet that I was talking about. But um, excellent. I have that, to jump uh, off because I actually have trial tomorrow. So that that's no good. Um, no, trial tomorrow is fine. It's not till two. So we're going to pull up. Um, so what does she yell? Um, cool. Let me jump off first. Jack? Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, guys, check out Rob Lawn Lumber. Um, He'll be on Friday. I might 
be able to pop in, but if I do, there will probably be um, loud noises. noises in the background. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and to the chat, Leo's doing great. The sock swallowing, uh, we got the sock removed. So, um, you did Leo's a sockectomy. Leo's fine. You realize, however, that my client insists on compensation for you negligent nope. leaving that sock out. So Leo requires treats and pats in compensation for your negligence, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not OSHA. <laughs> you do not. Uh, I'm sorry. That you, to... you are the safety supervisor of Leo. Uh, yeah. oh. I don't like you very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the whole sock swallowed, whole sock removed. So Leo's good. Good night, guys. Thank you guys for being here, and I'll see you guys on Friday. Bye. All right. So let's um, let's cover what was said, because um, that's exciting. Apparently, she yells, stack from the very get-go, it's a bunch of fucking bullshit. Um, so, fair. Um, you know, she she's... She's not happy. I don't mean fair as in that is a correct assessment. I mean, I get why she's unhappy. It's not going to be a happy moment for her. Um, now, there's some other things I want to cover. Um, so first, let us pull up. Um, and you guys are probably going to be able to hear this, but I'm just uh, pulling it up here. Um, let us pull up this. Bowles gets an interview. Can she get a contempt charge? No one's charging mom with contempt. Um, no one's charging mom with contempt. Okay, so here's Bowles. That is super quiet. Um, let me pull Bowles down and try to ennoison him. Can people hear Bowles? No, nobody can hear bulls. Okay, um, I'm going to pull bulls down. I'm going to try to enhance the noises that bulls makes. Um, we're going to go to 450% maximum over bulls. Um, all right, let's try this again. We're going to try to get bulls to be noisy. Oh, people can't hear the audio because um, I swapped the audio out. That would be why. Okay, now we're going to try. Let's let's hear bulls. Uh, we're obviously <laughs> disappointed in the verdict, but we are disappointed in a lot of things that happened in that courtroom. We plan to appeal. But we believe we've got a number of issues that we will be asserting. We obviously respect the jury's decision, but... We have a number of issues that we, um, you know, <laughs> that we will be... And the, they're going to ask him, like, what issues? And he's going to say, mm. We uh, have a lot of work to do, and we will be doing on this appeal. What, what the things that happened in the courtroom that you're disappointed in? Can you elaborate? Um, we, I will not elaborate on that, but that will be filed in our appellate briefs. I will not elaborate on that. Now, there's two reasons why he might not elaborate. One, he's going to have to take some time and actually figure out the issues he wants to do. Two, um, he can put all sorts of things in a filing that are, you know, that might otherwise be defamatory that he can't say here. So, um, and we're going to see that there might be a hint on that one. What was your sense? Did you feel like the, the, about the, the, uh, the, the, the silver back primer as opposed to the, the patina? What was your sense about uh, the government, in, you know, in that? Uh, my sense was the evidence wasn't sufficient to convict, and it was a lot of guesswork and a lot of speculation. But again, the jury rendered its verdict, and we'll be appealing that. Did you did you feel like the sense that jury was kind of you know the you know the, the Alec Baldwin uh, part of it? Is it uh, you know do you feel like the government actually was, was fair? Government was not fair, absolutely not fair. And that will be part of our appeal. Um, I think everybody saw what happened in that court. When I heard that, I was like, 
danger, danger, be careful. The government was not fair. If he goes one sentence too far there, he gets sued. He gets potentially, uh, you know, complaints. But he says, and that'll, I think everybody saw that in that courtroom. Um, he's being, he was cagey. He avoided the issue. There. We'll be addressing it. Um, what's your reaction to the not guilty verdict? What's your reaction to the not guilty? Obviously, he's happy with that. I think that was the right verdict on that count. Why did your client decide not to testify? That's all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Why did your client decide not to testify? Go to hell, sir. Um, they're obviously not going to answer that one. I wouldn't answer that one. Like, come on. Um, so that is his comment. But I also want to show you something else that I think is very, very interesting. Um, because I think it shows a major blunder Bowles made. And this is a jury interview uh, or a juror interview. They got a juror to make a statement. And this shows Bowles screwed up hard. Um, this guy. Been your overall thoughts about the trial, everything you heard um, throughout these 10 days? Pretty much uh, very unsafe conditions. And it was obvious. I mean, there was nothing we couldn't miss. <laughs> While you guys were in there, it was pretty quick that you guys came to a decision. Um, you know, what was the things that you guys took into consideration and was the thing that really convinced you guys that she was guilty? It was the, a lot of the safety issues that she could have paused work, stopped, cleared it all up, and just never did. I deal a lot with safety up in. He deals a lot with safety. I'm like, holy shit. Why is this guy on the jury? And I work in Los Alamos, so I deal a lot with it. And they'd say, you don't stop work, just pause work. Was there uh, a particular witness? Or Did you catch that? He says he works at Los Alamos. Los Alamos. Um, Los Alamos is... Sort of is the is almost certainly the Los Alamos National Laboratory, um, which is also like the place that the atomic bomb was born. Um, like Los Alamos, you let a guy who works on Los Alamos, um, oh my god, like. Y I, I just don't know how to phrase this. He works at a safety critical facility. And, and this guy, we're going to hear he's a truck driver. What do truck drivers have to do? They have to do safety certifications and so forth. And I'm going, you, I fight like hell to keep anybody from Los Alamos off of my jury so hard because like this is going to be of all the people who have familiarity with safety critical jobs you you pick this guy right like oh my god bowls why is this guy on why for a particular moment a piece of video something that the prosecution said that really sank in with you mm, pretty much is just that all the never did the safety checks, never checked the rounds to pull them out, to look at them, shake them. I mean, if you'd have done that, this wouldn't have happened. Was there this guy's pretty like this guy's pretty down to earth? He's just like, and he just he understands the basics of it. Like, he just he's like, you, you do the safety checks. What does this guy have to do? The like the trucker, he has to do safety checks every time he gets into his truck. Right. This guy. Like you might say, oh, this guy's like blue collar. He's you know, he's giving these very simple answers. Um, this guy scares the f out of me if I'm on Bowles's team. This guy is my worst nightmare because he does not get bullshitted. All of your bullshit arguments. He's just going to be like, nope, nope, that's not working on me. This guy is a zero bullshit kind of dude. For any moment that anyone in the jury maybe didn't agree with the guilty verdict. Mm. They had their 
ideas or their concerns, but after talking it all out, it pretty much, uh, they were convinced. How do you feel about the decision today? I think it was fair. Yeah. Yeah. And if he, someone died, I mean, you got to take responsibility, especially when you're handling weapons and you're in charge of those. That's, that's your job. And lack of experience or whatever you want to call it, you took the job. How was much this a difficult job? decision for you to come to? The what? Was this a difficult decision for you to come to? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> was this a difficult decision for you to come to? He's like, nah, nah. This one was, this is pretty basic. Like, he's like, this is duh. Well, after hearing everything and then thinking about it, mostly because I deal with a lot in safety, being in Los Alamos and all the things around and being in other jobs that were the same way, especially driving with CDL driver, I, I have to check and my vehicle make sure I'm not going to slam into people or do something like that. That was her job to check those rounds, those firearms. And if no one wanted to pay attention or do that, then she could stop the work. This is the guy who understands the whole thing about like, you have the authority to step, stop work. You have the authority to, to do this. And he's like, I have to check. I'm the, you know, he's a CDL. He's not, the lowest guy on the totem pole, but he's not anywhere near the highest guy on the totem pole. He's like, I understand what it is to be the safety guy because I am the safety guy with regards to my truck. Um, I didn't hear yeah and no. What I heard was yeah, no, which is at least where I am. It's, um, you know, yeah, no is an emphasis to no, right? So... Was there How anything that the defense said that maybe convinced you or made you think that Hannah Gutierrez Reed was actually being scapegoated? No, I don't think so. Do you believe she brought live rounds on set? If she did, she didn't. If she didn't know it, and she did, but yeah, we think she did. How much Can of it all? We think she did. We think she brought the live rounds. Did actor Alec Baldwin play a part in your deliberations or any other cast or crew members that were in there? Well, they're, they're going to have their day, his day. So we really didn't take that into consideration. It wasn't part of it. He's like, Baldwin's going to Baldwin's going to do Baldwin things. We're, we're just here doing our own thing. The reaction when the, when the decision came down. I don't know. I didn't see nothing. I didn't look at it. So I'll sit in the back. <laughs> that's, that's about it. Can you spell your name for us? So he just spells his name. Like, I... Now, people have said that there's two major labs that are huge employers in the area, so maybe it was hard to keep it when a guy like this off the jury. This guy is my worst-case scenario if I'm the defense, right? I want somebody... I don't want somebody in this kind of safety role. I don't want this guy. And if if defense had any way to keep this guy off the jury and they didn't. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. Still listening. How did this dude get on the jury? Wow. Sounds pretty much identical to my thoughts on the trial. Um, yeah. Uh, Runkle, stunt coordinators also have set responsibility. Yep. Um, stunt coordinators would have to like, hey, this stunt is going to go wrong. Uh, I have questions. Defense did not understand the assignment. So um, I said I would talk a bit about what this means for Hannah. Hannah's got another trial coming up. Hannah is being charged for uh, having a gun in a bar. And that trial actually has a much stiffer sentence. So the prosecution may have some leverage to try to push her into a settlement based on that charge as well. So that's another possibility as well. Um, now, in terms of what this means for Baldwin, uh, Baldwin benefits by going second in this trial. And what I mean by that is that everybody, um, everybody on this um, says, like, gave a statement. 
And so you're going to be able to cross-examine them with their videotape testimony of them at a previous trial where they were under oath. And um, was it? 2A Freedom says, anyone who be actually believes this green-haired 26-year-old had any authority to pause anything is kidding themselves. She has the authority to walk. And if she walks, they shut down everything with guns. And if she walks and they continue with the guns and somebody dies, she's the star witness for the prosecution. She's not on trial. Like, yeah. Please explain the gun in a bar thing. Apparently, and I haven't dug through the indictment on that one in huge detail. Um, apparently, she brought a gun out in a bar and that is a no-no. So, yeah. Um, none of us have heard of this bar case. All right. Um, yeah. Gun bar. I'm just trying to pull up a good summary here. Um, the problem is that everything is the guilty, you know, I'm going to have to do another thing to actually go through the, uh, the bar allegation, but there is a separate charge there and I'm going to have to dig that up to, um, to go through it. But, um, so, ah, here we go. Uh, she is alleged to have walked into the Matador pub, so unlawful possession of a firearm while inside a licensed liquor establishment. Uh, they say she went into the Matador pub and somehow they found that she had a gun. So um, you're not allowed in that area to have a gun in a, uh, a licensed liquor establishment. And so because of that, she's facing those charges. Those charges actually have a higher maximum than the 18 months. And yeah, her own personal firearm. So like she she has a carry permit or she had a carry gun. So, um, but you're not allowed to bring the gun into a bar in that area. Lots of places have rules on that. So she's facing charges on that. Why was it brought up in... Uh, why was this brought up or why wasn't this brought up in the trial? Because that would have been propensity evidence and so forth. So, and somebody says she took a selfie in the bathroom with it. Jeez, that's dumb. Um, so she is, people are saying, what is she facing? 18 months max. So she's not going to get any more than 18 months. I think she'll get less than 18 months on this. We'll have to see what happens with the bar charge. If I'm the prosecution, I might say, hey, we'll drop the whole bar charge if you plead or if you testify. So that's, um, that's going to be that issue there. All right. I'm going to wrap this up fairly quickly. I'm going to go through super chats and I'm going to, um, and then I'm going to shut things down here because I need to get some sleep. It has been, um, it has been a while since I got any sleep. All right. So, um, wouldn't taking a deal be risky with regards to live rounds? Um, at this point, like a deal, hopefully you have the deal all buttoned up. So, um, yeah, um, hopefully that's all squared away and yeah. All right. So, um, uh, Creek native girl, thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. I'm still wondering, uh, I, I first read that as Cree. So yeah. Uh, Kayla Eloisa, thanks for your coverage. I'm not a huge gun person, but I understand the importance of safety and basic knowledge. You've greatly helped with that. Here's something small for your pro bono fund. Thank you so much, Kayla. It's really appreciated. Kimberly Stovall, I was a 23-year-old uh, that was an armor slash PA in live theater in the 90s. I had more firearm experience than anyone in that company. This was a person thing, not a girl thing. Absolutely. And like this whole notion of like a 24-year-old can't do the job or a 24-year-old woman. Yeah, they can. They just have to do the job. Um, Bridget Oster, thank you so much for the five gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Squinting Cat, thanks for your great coverage of this trial each night. Thank you so much. I am not going to miss um, not getting sleep, though. I'm going to enjoy that. Brandon Meyer, thank you so much for the YouTube membership. And thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Very generous. Thank you. Michelle Alley, Hannah's bullet necklace seems in poor taste and poor judgment for the last day of her trial. It's actually a crystal. Um, we've seen it zoomed in. It's not a bullet necklace. Um, it's a it's a little crystal that she wears. I think it's probably for luck. And, you know, it didn't bring her a whole lot of luck there. So, um, 
Yeah. Hannah Gutierrez Reed is infuriatingly disinterested and aggressively irresponsible. Yeah. Lisa BS, did he just suggest the jury take notice of items not in evidence? Um, are you referring to bowls? Kind of. Um, Caitlin Moore, done three rails, five car trips, and one RV trip cross country. RV for tourist sightseeing, rail for general, cars if mad. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your coverage and get rest. Thank you so much. Teresa GV, what would be the basis for appeal? I think their best basis for the appeal is the um, uh, is the drug issue, but it sounds like he's going to be raising a bunch of fights with the prosecutor. Fiona W, thank you for the 10 gifted membership. You know I'll cover the appeal when it drops. KDD, thank you for the uh, the membership there. Uh, lost uh, in a crowd of three. Uh, would Hannah have a case of ineffective assistance of counsel against this guy? No. The standard for ineffective assistance of counsel is really, really high. And I don't think that they can make it out here. Um, ineffective assistance of counsel basically requires that you be, um, you know, that your lawyer be sleeping or actively harmful in some way and more than what we've seen. So I don't think they're going to be able to make out ineffective assistance of counsel here um, at all. It's just, um, this guy sucked, but sucked isn't the, um, isn't the standard, right? Um, you can have a, a bad lawyer or a, a lawyer who has a bad trial or whatever else. It's not ineffective until they start like blundering on things. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think that he could, I don't think she can make that out. So, um, yeah. Um, uh, Bueller 007, when a lawyer makes a terrible argument, do they know it's bad and hope the jury will buy it? Or are they not bright and it's the best they can muster? Sometimes it's both. Um, I think in this case, he was just doing the best with what he had. Uh, Mama of three, I love that for some reason, the one who pointed the G at the judge did get a, or, uh, didn't get a recap. Because um, he, I assume that that's what it, I didn't see a recap for that guy. Oops, didn't get a recap. Typo. Yes. <laughs> Alan uh, Mueller, could the state have made a good case without the statements to the police? It would have been harder. Um, they probably could have, possibly on Hannah, but it would have been a lot harder. Um, Joloy, Ian, can you physically uh, can you physically feel through your fingers if a dummy can rattle? Yes, I did that test. I was able to do it. So, E. Warner, question. It wasn't even hard. Would it have been better for Hannah Gutierrez if her team had taken responsibility? Have you ever done that? Um, her... I don't know how our team would take responsibility there. Like they can't say we suck. You know, we were bad lawyers. The unwanted man. How much of the evidence slash witnesses from this trial will also be in the Alec Baldwin trial? Oh, you just ran off. I hope it wasn't something I said. Um, the uh, like Mr. Haig, a bunch of the experts will definitely be repeated. A lot of the witnesses will be repeats. So um, Allison Lee, thank you so much for the super sticker there. Uh, Caitlin shoot met EDB in Vegas. Would love to meet you and Rob next. I'm going to be in Vancouver. I will probably arrange more meetups at in future sort of when I can mispronounced name, ask the armor to do the dummy demonstration. Um, I don't know if they did actually, uh, against the tide, please like, and check out his channel role of law. Thank you so much. Uh, Emma Zay, thank you for the five gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Kimberly G, thank you for the uh, new membership there. Much appreciated. Um, I'm just trying to keep track of a whole lot of different things. Uh, Kimberly G, thank you for the membership. Uh, Elizabeth Webster, thank you for the membership. Marbled Cat, what's the chance that defense deliberately threw the case because of some backroom deal between Baldwin and Hannah? Defense was so damaging. Why? Um, I would never th deliberately throw a case. There's no amount of money you could send me to deliberately throw a case. So, yeah. Secret Labs customer support. I appreciate you not sitting wrong. <laughs> uh, Kathy, or Kathy Chapin. Why wouldn't Hannah's stepdad testify for his daughter? Maybe because he would have to lie. Or say, I brought the ammo, um, which would be bad for him. Pants, it should be, hello, my name is Inspector Montoya. I am from OSHA. Do you comply? Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I thought it was prepare to be fined. The world wonders if Baldwin doesn't testify. I think it's 50 50. If he goes up on the stand with her, I go to Vegas and bet two months pay on guilty. Yeah, I kind of feel that he would be a very bad witness for his side. Jose B, 
Hannah's team should have advised her to cop a plea before everyone else. It's too late now because of her lack of empathy and remorse. They turned down a deal, and I bet that deal's looking real tasty right now. Shan Shan 2017, thank you for the YouTube membership. Allison Lee, when you stop video, can you rewind just a bit after you give your thoughts? I know it's late in the game. Uh, fair. I will try to do that in future. Thank you so much. Um, Jose B, their styles make for a lopsided boxing match. He was more the, the boxing dummy. Uh, Marguerite Brody, does this prosecutor have no empathy? Put her in custody. Cold. I found some interactions between and the corporal very concerning. Is the pain of a young woman titillating? That's fair. I don't think... I don't think a lot of people like the prosecutor as a person. I think that they liked some of her work. Um, just a small town girl. Thank you for the five gifted memberships. Devin, thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. Karen G, haha, there's a brand of feminine hygiene products in Latin America. Their brand color is that pink. I'm reminded each time you play that. <laughs> so Michelle M, I wonder if Hannah had shown some, rem if she'd shown some remorse, the verdict would have been different. It might. Um, Blessed in Texas, Bowles failed spectacularly to represent his client zealously. Yep. Emily C., I've been a vod goblin this whole trial. I've really appreciated your thoughts and commentary on the case. Bowles' capabilities left me shook. I I don't understand him at all. Brown Eyed Girl 1367, thank you so much for the membership there. Against the Tide, please like. Thank you, Ian, for doing all this hard work and living this trial. Thank you. Uh, Bambarina, she's Helena's friend, and that hat was Helena's. Oof. Um, wearing the hat, like bringing the hat to court. Um, that's the thing. Oh, I'm being told I got to show the mug shot. Um, mug shot. Where did I put the mug shot? Mug shot. I have the mug shot. All right. Um, let me show you guys the mug shot. Stop screen, present, share screen. And mug shot. So, um, so Rachel Mason, a friend of Hutchins, attended the trial and is directing and producing a documentary about her life titled Helena. Ooh. So that's the mugshot. Um, so you can see she's at Sound of Fay County. I don't know if you can see this, but she's not wearing the earrings anymore. Those earrings would have gone into property. Um, and she's had to do a clothing change. She's had to all of that. So, um, yeah, I don't think she's enjoying her time already. Charlie, would she be at risk on the outside due to publicity? She's going to be at more risk on the inside due to publicity. So, and they don't incarcerate people for their own protection typically. Uh, why wasn't her steps uh, sitting with her mom? Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe they don't get along. I don't know. Michael Ring, I wonder how much of this is political. New Mexico is one of the most anti-gun states and is notorious for putting deadly criminals back on the street. I don't, I can't speak to that. Please embiggen the audio. Sorry about that. Thank you, James K. Graciela Gonzalez. Hello from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, love uh, fire 5 p.m. here at the moment. Thank you so much. Akefia, uh, just wanted to say I really enjoyed listening to your recaps while at work over the last two weeks. Grab some Timmy's for a trial well covered. I'm not a big fan of Timmy's, but I will probably buy myself like a Caesar. Thank you. Devin, thanks for these recaps. Much appreciated. Thank you, Devin. Uh, Nikki MCR Mama, thank you so much for the super sticker. Uh, Elliot JN, clarification, risk of incriminating stepdad. Yeah, um, I don't think he wanted to testify for that. Tyler K, perhaps Balls uh, should have worn it for good luck. <laughs> Shiraz, thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Saldarius, I was a nurse when I was younger than Hannah and somehow managed to not go to prison for manslaughter. Age is no excuse. Yep. And Annabelle Feinstein, thank you so much for the five gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Um, and if, Ian, if I'm not mistaken, the other gun charges Hannah's facing comes from the image or images they obtained from her phone. The images showed her in the matador with a gun. That might be the case, in which case, ouch. Uh, in which case, her lawyer sucks if she agreed to turn over evidence that they could use that. Please tell. Shampoo preference. Thank you so much. I just use whatever there is. Um, I think right now it's a Dove shampoo, but I just use whatever there is. I'm not super, like, I don't really have a brand, if that makes sense. I just kind of grab what's on the shelf if I'm there. So, um, 
Yeah. Uh, Cat W, thank you so much for all your trial coverage. Thank you. Um, and this, uh, with the verdict on her, what do you think about Alec's verdict? Think a plea would look much more likely. Alec is not pleading. He's just not pleading at all. Um, he's not going to plead out. There's just no circumstance where that happens, I don't think. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is correct. Whatever my wife puts in the shower. Um, and people are saying just tweet it out. There's a usual thing that like, there's the usual soap that she buys, but we ended up getting something different by accident. So, um, yes. Uh, Lara M saying, does this mean she can't own guns? Yes. As a felon, she would be prevented from owning guns in the future and possessing guns and so forth. Um, if I visit the U S I will have more gun rights in the U S which you don't have many as a foreigner than she would. Um, so, um, she can have less than, than that. Um, <laughs> people are so obsessed with long hair dudes, uh, hair care routines. I do have a get ready with me video. So if you want to see my morning routine, you can see my, uh, you can watch my get ready with me. I do talk about hair washing in that. Um, so you, you can see that. Um, can a felon get their record expunged? Yes, I believe so eventually, but I think that differs from state to state. Um, let me get this straight. Her own lawyer got her in more trouble than she would have been in otherwise. Um, sounds like Apple Silver. Runkle, please tell the wake up call sales guy story. Okay, let me tell you why I'm so tired today. So, uh, this microphone, um, this microphone, um, that microphone, I bought it some years ago from a company online. And as part of that, they asked for my phone number uh, because everybody wants your phone number um, now when you want to buy stuff. So I went and browsed their webpage looking for a shock mount for this mic. Um, and it turns out they're sold out on the shock mic, right? They're, they're sold out. They don't have any. But because they saw I browsed their webpage, they decided that they were going to reach out to me for a sales call in order to try to sell me something. And they decided to do this first thing in the morning, first thing in the morning. And they are on the East Coast. They're on the East. So, um, so what does that mean? It means I got to bed at like 2.30. And like, cause I often have trouble sleeping. I just, that's how I am. And so, um, I got to bed at like two 30. I wake up to this phone call because I also have been doing some investigative reporting. I've been trying to reach certain people. So my ringer is on. So, because I've been trying to reach some people in um, Illinois and um, Indiana and so forth. And so they call and it wakes me up and I'm like, hello. And they're like, hi, we're from company and we would like to, you know, I'm your sales engineer. And I'm like, motherfucker, um, do you have any idea what time it is? And, um. So yeah, um, I I was very polite. I just said like, hey, are you aware? Like, it's very early. And they said, oh, um, uh, sorry, I didn't realize the time zone. And I was like, okay, click. And I didn't say motherfucker. I just said, um, I just said, it's very early. I was asleep. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the time zone. I was actually quite polite. And um, so, yes, I know. I was saying sales engineer mocking their term of that. So um, they then, um, so I, I wake up, I'm now awake. I call that company and I'm like, hey, by the way, um, Yes, kind of. <laughs> um, so um, I call them back once I'm awake and I'm like, so um, 
just so you know, I like you guys woke me up and they're like, oh, I don't I'm sure they don't mean to. I'm like, I understand you didn't mean to. Please lose my number. And they're like, uh, and I'm like, please just delete all information you have about me. They're like, we won't call you again. I'm like, Thank you. And I will tell you, there is no way I'm doing business with that company again, because I will pay more money to not be woken up at the middle of the night. So I don't understand that one at all. Um, and so SB, I still can't understand how Hannah is at fault instead of whoever hired her. It feels like if Delta hired a bus driver to fly a plane to me, like maybe the bus driver doesn't know any better. It's literally her job. She held herself out as a person who is capable of doing the safety and she wasn't able to. Um, where is the morning routine video? I'm working on redoing my own morning routine. Um, if you search my YouTube channel for Get Ready With Me, you should find it. Um, I don't recommend adopting my morning routine, though. And Bell Feinstein, phone wakes uh, wakes me. It better be damn good, or is this an emergency? Yeah. Um, if you're going to wake me up in the middle of the night, you'd better be in jail. And, yeah. A collab with Mata would make my year. I don't know who that is. Um, so, yeah. Um, what is it? Um, I know, Runkle, they put you on a do not call list, but they have all your the information you gave them, including your number. I know. Um, just so long as they don't phone me again at like stupid o'clock, that's that's fine. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so, um, I'm gonna wrap this up. I'm gonna go and get an earlier night than I have been. It's like 11 30, so I'm uh, I'm gonna go try to get some sleep. Um, but I will, um, yeah. And Alexis Carney says, according to GDPR, they're supposed to delete your information. Neither me nor this company is covered by GDPR, so yeah. Um, Mata's Defense Diaries. I will try to reach out to Defense Diaries, see what's going on there, and um, we'll try to figure it out. Um, maybe that would be a good thing to do. Okay, I'm going to go get some sleep. Um, I am so tired. So thank you guys for joining me. See you guys uh, next time. I don't know what when the next time is. It might be, probably won't be Monday. We'll have to see. I don't know if I'll get a Monday show in. We'll, we'll see. So good night, everybody. Um...